Hello and welcome to the Irish Tourism Industry Confederation leading the Tourism Recovery Conference. We're coming to you live from O'Reilly Hall at UCD in Dublin. My name is Derva MacDonald and it is a privilege to join ITIC once again for this, their inaugural virtual conference. And what a far cry it is from our last major gathering in 2019 for the Irish Tourism Industry Awards, when we were in the surge of a record number of visitors to the island of Ireland and when issues such as Brexit, a shortage of hotel rooms and even fears of over-tourism were then occupying our minds. The coronavirus that swept the globe last year has brought many sectors to heel. But few have been as deeply impacted as the tourism and hospitality sector, with an estimated 85% drop in revenue and a staggering 160,000 job losses. There is no doubt that we are in the hard yards, but hope beckons in the form of innovative therapies and vaccine rollouts are underway. And today we are going to try and look beyond the pandemic to explore how this vital sector can thrive again. And we have a fantastic programme for you. I will be joined shortly by ITIC Chairperson Ruth Andrews to discuss a flagship report just issued by ITIC, which sets out how the industry can survive this crisis. And new IATA Chief Willie Walsh will be flying in, in a manner of speaking, to give his thoughts on what recovery might look like in the years ahead. Minister Catherine Martin, TD, Minister for Tourism, Culture, Arts, Geltock, Sport and Media, will then join me to discuss government policies and priorities for this key sector. We will also reveal the recipient of this year's Tourism Industry Lifetime Achievement Award. And after a short break, we'll have scientist, author, musician and entrepreneur, Professor Luke O'Neill, who's going to pop into studio to talk about life inside and outside of the lab. Finally, in what I think you will agree is a compelling agenda, we'll hear from a panel of industry experts about what needs to happen next and what the future of tourism looks like beyond lockdown. We wrap up no later than one o'clock, and just because we're a virtual does not mean we are not interactive. You are a vital part of the conversation, so we invite you to take part online using the hashtag ITICConf21. That's hashtag ITICConf21. But before we look to the future, here is ITIC Chief Executive Owen O'Mara Walsh leading a look back on a year like no other. I think 2020 started fairly positively. We were looking to build on the great success that we'd had in 2019. We'd had 10 million international visitors and January and February started fairly positively. We had good access into the country, a growth of transatlantic routes. So it was an exciting year. The biggest challenge was Brexit. Was there going to be a hard Brexit? That was the biggest challenge. And of course, none of us had any idea of what was coming down the tracks at us. I heard about COVID the first time on the 11th of February in London. I was in Port Cullis House at a Brexit task force meeting with Tours Marland. We went through a whole load of analysis about customer sentiment about Brexit, particularly about the British market into Ireland. And David Boyce at Tours Marland mentioned at the end of the meeting a concern about a epidemic of a flu influenza in China at the time. First person diagnosed with the coronavirus on the island passed through the airport from northern Italy before travelling to Belfast. I remember being at an IHF conference uh, in Galway uh, in February and uh, myself, Minister Brendan Griffin at the time, um, Siobhan McManamy of Tourism Ireland and Darren Clark, actually one of the Minister's advisors, we had a sort of an, an impromptu first COVID meeting actually across the road from the conference in a bar in Galway of all places and we kind of said to each other well how serious is this going to be but even then we had no idea of what was coming at us uh, like like a steaming train. There was great uncertainty as whether St Patrick's Day would go ahead whether the the parade and the, and the festival would go ahead and obviously that's a spotlight on Ireland globally so it's very important to the tourism industry and it's very much the springboard for the season ahead so we were very much of the view that the festival and the parade needed to go ahead as planned. Uh, but then, of course, it was cancelled. Um, and that's, I think, when we... When I remember being in the office with, with Arlene and Catherine and we looked at each other and we went, crap, this is going to be big, this is going to be serious, uh, this is going to be a, a real seismic issue that we're going to have to deal with. This is the calm before the storm, before the surge. And when it comes, and it will come, never will so many ask, so much or so few. Very quickly, uh, particularly uh, the second week in March, with the restrictions imposed in the US and then the lockdown all over Europe, it literally, uh, overnight, it, it hit us. We were looking at pictures from Italy of, of army lorries moving 
large numbers of corpses uh, to, to burials. And that was quite striking, and that really caused a real concern. Today's children will tell their own children and grandchildren about the national holiday in 2020 that had no parties, no parades, but instead saw everyone staying at home to protect each other. So we really both are dependent on the international visitor that comes to Ireland and indeed comes to the west of Ireland and spends time here. And I think that became a recurring theme for the year. Every time there was a lockdown, um, tourism and hospitality businesses were in the economic front line. We were the ones closed, we were the ones shut, we were the ones who had to introduce very strict restrictions. So the trading circumstances became very, very difficult. And we, like many businesses in the region, had to make very difficult choices. Uh, we had to reduce working hours, implement temporary layoffs, curtail you know, operations, and that's very difficult. We were allowed reopen at the end of June, uh, which was a plus because that was a few weeks ahead of schedule. So it gave us a little bit of a summer season, but it was only the domestic market. We had Irish people staycationing at home. We had no international tourists. And I think that is the big issue that we've got to remember that back in 2020, that international tourism died into the country. We're losing, well, over a million euros every single day. We're fast approaching losses this year of 150 million year to date. So it's devastating. So as restrictions began to ease um, on June 29th, 2020, we reopened the site fully to the visitors. So it was fantastic to be able to get trading again, to welcome visitors, and we were welcoming visitors from the domestic market. During that first lockdown, um, the ITIC board met numerous times. We, were knew, we knew we were dealing with an existential crisis for the industry, and we knew ITIC had to take a leadership position on a lot of these issues. And we put together a very comprehensive and thorough revival plan for the industry, which we published at the end of June. It was actually on the very day that the tourism economy was allowed to reopen. You know, representation is, you know, saying the right thing at the right time to the right person. And it took an age for a new government to be formed. But during that period of, of endless sort of negotiations between the, the various political parties, it gave us an opportunity and it gave ITIC an opportunity to, if you like, leverage the situation for tourism's benefit. And the outgoing minister was Shane Ross, who ironically had lost his seat, but until the new government was formed, he remained the Minister for Tourism. And we encouraged him strongly to put together an industry-led Tourism Recovery Task Force. And to give Minister Ross his due, he appointed Ruth Andrews, who was the ITIC chair, as head of the Tourism Recovery Task Force. So now, at the centre of government, we had Ruth leading a vehicle for tourism's recovery. There was an awful lot of uniformity in terms of the messaging. And you had people like uh, Ruth Andrews, obviously, uh, leading uh, out on, on ITIC's uh, behalf. But you also had Elena Fitzgerald Kane from the Hotels Federation and Tim Fenn. You had Adrian Cummins uh, from the Restaurants Association. You had Pora Cribben from the Vintners. People like Con Quill from the Caravan and Camping Sector. Brendan Kenny from the um, Adventure Sector. Nikki McGrain and Roland Flood from the Conference Organizers. There was a whole raft of people who took the ITIC message and hammered it home. The blanket 14-day self-isolation effectively writes off over 70% of the sector's revenue. In addition to this, the capacity restrictions of social distancing and the challenges to domestic demand created by health and economic concerns will also depress revenue levels. Today, in recognition of the unprecedented challenges facing particular and really important sectors of our economy, I am announcing a reduced VAT rate for the hospitality and tourism sector from 13.5% to 9% with effect from the 1st of November of this year. I think the whole um, re-imposition of restrictions again in the autumn was very demoralising for, for employees, demoralising for the business because having done all the work to, to make sure that we were ready and we um, our customers and our consumers were comfortable to come back. Obviously everything was, was effectively shut down again. So as we reached the end of the year, um, we were sort of um, in, in a strange situation because we, we, we should have all felt very positive about the news on the vaccine. That was, that was the breakthrough, that was the silver bullet and that would lead to a normalisation, if you like, of, of the whole economy, including the tourism economy. And of course we had avoided a hard Brexit. We finally got a deal on Brexit, which was equally important uh, to the tourism sector. So we should have been positive on those fronts, but 
Uh, Christmas um, was literally around the corner and there was an announcement of another level five lockdown, which was the third very serious lockdown. And again, government reached for the sledgehammer and closed tourism and travel and hospitality. Um, I think 2021 will be a difficult year. Um, there's still so much unknown about 2021, but there is hope. There is a vaccine coming and there is a rollout of that vaccine and that we're very grateful for. I think the thing though, we, we all realized how serious this was. We were in a global pandemic, um, it was unprecedented. But I think what has been a real eye-opener for us is the longevity, that we're here 12 months later and we're in phase three of, of, of this virus. Yeah, it has been absolutely um, devastating for tourism and hospitality businesses, um, ju not just on the Wild Atlantic Way, but in the west of Ireland, but in the country as a whole. And, we are still in the middle of that crisis now that we're in lockdown three. Lots of businesses are teetering on the edge. And I think what's crucial is that government and society know that tourism cannot be forsaken. We cannot let tourism and hospitality go under as a result of this crisis. Preserving cash has been really the name of the game for a lot of the industry and survival. It is all about survival because we need to be, we need to survive to get open again, to get on with the business of hospitality and that is dependent on COVID cases, vaccines and a testing regime that allows free movement of people. I've been around a long time. Uh, I've seen lots of different things. I've seen lots of different prices. None of them to compare with this, by the way. But, but as sure as eggs are eggs, this will end. And essentially we will get back to what I would term the new normality. If you look to Europe, they have high speed rail, they have advanced motorway systems. As an island nation, we don't have that. We need people to get onto the island. And that's why the reopening of aviation in a safe manner is going to be really crucial. And the rollout of the vaccine and escalating the rollout of the vaccine to give confidence again to people to come into our country is really important. I'm absolutely certain that with a fair wind and a proper vaccination system, we will come out the other side of this and we will get back to doing what we do well in Ireland, which is looking after people and giving them a great experience. And I have no doubt that in two or three years' time, we look back and go, oh my God, wasn't that tough? The cheapers, we survived it. And I think we will survive it, and we will, because we have to. We will survive because we have to survive. The words there, Ruth Andrews of Paul, are so striking. But before we get to that year that was and the real crisis that the industry has faced, this morning is very, very sad because last weekend we lost former ITIC chairman Eamon McKeown and it's a huge loss uh, to the industry. I understand the funeral takes place this morning as our event gets underway. That's right, Darvel, and good morning, everybody, and welcome. Um, yes, indeed, it's a bittersweet morning for many of us and for so many people across the industry who knew Eamon McKeown uh, as the leader that he was, as the mentor to so many, and, and I suppose on a personal note, he was certainly a mentor of mine. He and I worked together for a decade uh, in Great Southern Hotels, and we enjoyed a very uh, terrific friendship for many years since then. Um, and of course, he is a loss to the industry uh, in terms of one of those giants that really uh, was a leader and, and had the foresight to help us through so many other crises. And many people will remember him. I mean, he started as a young man in Board Falsha, um, God be good to those days. And he moved then uh, out to North America where he um, was the v VP for uh, CIE Tours. And when he moved back to Great Southern Hotels, of course, Great Southern was yeah. then owned by CIE. Uh, he was there as chief executive for many years. And in the latter part of his career, we were very lucky that we got him back to ITIC as our chief executive. And of course, he did a stellar career because uh, he was, you know, chairman of CERT at a time when CERT was being subsumed into, into Board Fault and it became Fault to Ireland and Eamon led the way on that. Of course, he was president of the Irish Hotels Federation. He was our former chairperson in ITIC also. So really, as I say, one of, uh, one of our greatest in terms And difficult for you as well, because he was a personal mentor to you as well as a friend. And of course, we're all thinking of his, uh, in ordinary times, 
I know. So many in the industry would, would be there to pay tribute. Yeah, and Carol and, and the family are there this morning laying him to rest. And, and I know he's going to be up there and he's looking down on us now. So as I say, he'll be watching us with uh, his usual keen eye to make sure that we're continuing to put our shoulders to the wheel. And we will celebrate his life when the time is right and when we have an opportunity. I know lots yeah. of people are asking that question, but we intend to do they so. They are indeed. And I thought it was just important to mark that this morning. Mm. And I wonder what he would have made of that <laughs> reeling in the year style video to have gone from, you know, it's almost as if the gods have mocked us. 2019, mm -hmm. record year, the island of Ireland, and then... Yep. Who could ever have imagined? And I say, isn't it very sobering when you actually look at that piece? Uh, it certainly brings back uh, the last 12 months in, in kind of broad technicolour. I mean, tourism has really taken such a battering uh, from this absolutely unexpected existential crisis. And even as our report uh, that we're launching today um, puts in context in terms of, you know, the global uh, situation, because tourism and travel globally have really taken the worst of what this pandemic has thrown at us. I mean, 75% of global visitations are down this year. And, and in Ireland... You the, know, scale, the scale of the job losses alone, I know I mentioned it yeah. at the outset, but 160,000 job losses, you know, when, the econ when this part of the economy get hits, it's the, 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 the extent of the job losses and that multiplier effect yeah. is significant. Absolutely significant. And, and bear in mind that so many of those jobs are in the region, so they're high mm -hmm. value jobs in terms of the fact that it's the spread that tourism gives. And, you know, we've gone from being the biggest Indigenous employer to being hit the hardest. But, you know, I, I think tourism has proven itself time and time again. We do bounce back. And when we do, we have an amazing capacity. And, and part of the reason rebuild. why you've um, published the report today, mm -hmm. um, I was reading it and thinking it's a bit like a Goldilocks um, thing. <laughs> you've kind of got a, a, a worst and OK and a best case uh, scenario. But you have you, you are looking ahead beyond 2021, 2022 and trying to look out to 25. And I suppose the best case scenario is that we could reach 2019 by 2025. But will you just talk me through the scenarios sure. that, that you projected in the report? Yeah. I suppose, you know, th th this is, I suppose, the second edition of uh, ITIC's initial work, which was the revival plan that we launched last June, which was very much done to influence the Tourism Recovery Task Force um, that had been set up by the, the former minister. Um, and, and of course, that, the role of that particular group was to uh, put together the measures and the policies and the recommendations to actually give us a roadmap for the next three years to rebuild Irish tourism. So our first edition of the Revival Plan was very much, of course, built in a time where we continue to have the unknown in terms of when recovery might come. So our, our latest edition of that in terms of the survival and revival plan that we've launched today is really putting in context where we are now. And where we are now is not where we thought we would be even six months ago, even possibly two months ago. So we're now looking at And survival. even looking at uh, the latest political commentary as of last night, um, it's a very, very dynamic situation. But broadly, yeah. what are the scenarios that you're looking at? Well, I mean, the scenarios, I suppose, start in terms terms of being kind of the baseline, where are we now? And, and, and bear in mind that it is such a fluid situation and, and that we remain in such flux that we've developed these scenarios on the basis of very shifting sands. Um, and as you say, the most optimistic that we need to look towards is when we can get, get back to those 2019 levels of business, when we get back to creating those number of jobs again. And we, we do envisage that that is possible by 2025 to 2026, but it is going to be contingent on the government continuing to commit to tourism and continuing to invest. And, and before we get to just the, the supports and I suppose what you're agitating for, just, just recap for us what the worst case scenario looks and feels like. Well, the worst case scenario, I suppose, ultimately feels like that we won't see recovery until uh, far, it'll take a much longer period of time. And obviously, you know, we need the aviation sector to recover and we need them to re recover as as, as quickly as they possibly can. But worst case is we could be looking at tourism not recovering until as far away as 2029. Um, so that is a scary prospect and, and it's not a scenario that we would be focusing on. We believe 
that we've got to focus. We know there's going to be a future. We know that when that future comes, when recovery comes, it's likely to be a V-shaped recovery because we mm -hmm. all know from the research that's out there, there's a V-shape coming in terms of demand. People need to move again. People are fed up being at home, being locked up, and yeah. there's an enormous appetite to travel. There's huge pent up demand and, and even looking at household savings um, at, at record yeah. levels, and yeah. hopefully we'll all benefit um, from that. The Obviously, you've outlined these different scenarios for how it may work out and obviously going for that Goldilocks um, best. But I want to speak to, because obviously a lot of the debate is around government supports. And when you look at Ireland, when you look at other countries, the role of the state has got very, very big. Mm -hmm. And the extent of supports uh, yes. to government's credits and in, to, yep. to our own yes. have been huge. They've yes. been extensive. Um, they possibly didn't think they were going to last this long um, either. But what are the kind of supports and every sector, it has to be Ruth, are crying out for special treatment. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, look at in, in, in our uh, survival and revival plan uh, that we've launched today. I mean, obviously we have 27 recommendations and of course they span over the period uh, of time in terms of survival to recovery. So it, it's very important that we we have that roadmap and that there are critical interventions that are going to be required in terms of measures and policy. And you're absolutely right. We can't deny that the government really have uh, come forward. They are doing an awful lot to support the industry and to support the economy broadly. Let's not forget that. But this is an industry that has been uh, hit hardest. And, and it is due to the necessary government restrictions that our business has been like a yo-yo effect of opening and closing. And, and we have fantastic businesses that, that are extremely viable, but are now seriously vulnerable because we have been given no option but to close. Well, the government can't come in and replace that overall six billion no, sure. revenue. Yeah. Um, it can't meet it at all. I know that in your earlier ask, you were looking for closer to 120 million. It, it came in um, at a 55 million. But maybe just the, the two, I suppose, the schemes that have been really significant for the sector are the CRSS and the wage subsidy. What are your hopes in respect of those schemes? Well, they're going to be absolutely vital because one of the key things that we have to maintain and keep intact are our people and keep them connected and in the jobs that are there. I mean, if, if we don't have, uh, I suppose, the intellectual capital that we've built up in those people and uh, who are so committed to the industry, we don't have those people ready and, and part of our recovery. Our pace of recovery is, is just going to be much slower than anybody would like. So EWSS, what we're asking for is that that is extended well out until the end of this year. And we need the certainty of that now. We need to give people who are still working with us the certainty to know that their job is secure. Businesses are working really hard to make up that difference to support those people that are benefiting and the, and, and the businesses that are benefiting from the EWSS. USS, but we need that certainty now. And similarly with the CRSS, some businesses haven't been able to access that. And of course, Fall to Ireland through the 55 million continuity grant are trying to make up that difference. But again, CRSS is, is really a very small proportion. It has a cap of, of 5,000 a week. You know, if you're a significant business, um, 5,000 while it does cumulatively add up, it, it is a very low cap. And again, we'd like to see government re revise that and relook at it. Is it a question of reviving schemes? So, for example, a lot of people said the, the stay and spend scheme was, you know, sure. well intended, but perhaps mm -hmm. it didn't quite hit the mark in terms of what it had hoped to achieve. But you can imagine from a government and exchequer level, the demands for very sector specific yeah. sport, supports must be huge. And this is, is, this is not a, be, a debate that's just happening in Ireland. Everywhere you go and particularly in the tourism sector it has to be said you yeah. know crying out for very very tailored supports but Pascal Donoghue must be a man under pressure he must be a lot of people <laughs> um, in his ear. Well as I say he was a former minister for tourism so I think Pascal knows as well and understands thankfully understands the industry exceptionally well as well so we're very lucky in that respect. Um, I suppose when we look at the sorts of supports that, that th this industry needs as I say we are going to have to get sector specific because there are other parts of the economy who although they've had to to close down, their businesses haven't taken the same level of hit that tourism and hospitality has. So we have to remember that. And even with cross-economy supports, really we've got to start looking about where across economy has had the greatest impact. And I think that is being reflected in their thinking, but we need to see more of it. But what but the industry needs is certainty. 
we're pretty certain now that we're in survival mode for the rest of this year. Um, and if, and if, I think recent remarks uh, by various government ministers have, have more or less settled the question as to whether or not um, it, if we have a tourism season this year, it's going to be a domestic one. Exactly. And bearing in mind domestic is important, it always has been, but it can never make up for the 75% of lost revenue that is our export side of the, the business. Now, I'm going to be speaking to Minister Martin later on um, this morning. I'm looking forward to that. But yeah. The report isn't just about recommendations. I, th I suppose if you plucked out two main ones and has been the clarion call of the industry, um, there's two that really sort of stick out. And the first is the importance of VAT for yes. the industry. Yes. Um, now, I might be able to say to you, no government minister, no government is going to commit itself to a multi-year proposal. You're coming back and saying that that's what's needed. We are, and we're saying, why not? Uh, the one thing, I suppose, when you point the, to the VAT and the 9%, which was a huge welcome return in terms of its reinstatement. And it was but great that the government... Well, very little effect this year because there's no business anyway. That's the point. And, and we've only had assurance that that VAT rate is going to remain in place until the end of this year. And frankly, that's really of little or no value. I mean, the one thing we know about the 9% VAT rate is it was the measure that was introduced, one of two measures that was introduced during the financial, during the crisis. financial crisis. And, and the government know and they have seen how that delivered, A, the recovery of tourism, the jobs that were delivered at that time, B, the competitiveness measure that it is um, to really help us drive recovery uh, of the international markets. So it is a real win-win benefit and we need that VAT rate. Uh, we need assurance that it's going to be there till 2025, frankly, because it needs to be there over survival and recovery. So that's frankly what we're asking for and, and we honestly believe it is a win-win. So it is something that we're going to need. And bear in mind as well, Derville, just I suppose in the next six weeks, uh, you know, I work with the Inbound Tour Operators Association and indeed with many of the, of the travel trade overseas. We're going to be doing our contracting now yes, yes. in the next number of weeks for 2022, for 2023 and, and obviously years beyond when you look at business tourism, mm -hmm. it can be eight years in gestation. But could so some, could someone legitimately come back and say, well, look, that's when the cry of the emergency becomes the permanent. Do you accept that, that, that I suppose the exchequer has to have some flexibility as well? It has to have some flexibility, but as I say, it's, it's a proven point mm. that that particular uh, measure has worked and it will work and it will help to drive recovery. But you need certainty. And right now when we're negotiating rates and we're trying to be as competitive as possible, we need at least that glimmer of, of Can I talk uh, to you? Because I, I stayed in my, my first hotel room since November 2019 <laughs> last night uh, because of the, the threat of the schnock. I know. <laughs> and it was extraordinary to be, um, to be to have a meal served, to have a conversation, to be reminded of the, the, the huge talent we have in our yeah. hospitality and tourism um, sector. And it really just struck me as they were handing me my tea on the way out this morning. But that, what you were talking about, about the risk of losing Mm -hmm. talent because of the extent of the job losses. There could be a lot of people in the industry, perhaps hoteliers, others running businesses, wondering that even with all of the furloughs, the supports, will they be getting that back? If there's a V-shaped recovery, will the talent and the, that institutional memory, that, that, um, that reputation that we have, will it be there? Yeah, and it's, it's, do you know what, it's going to be, and it's something that I know is worrying so many businesses at the moment. I mean, I know business owners who haven't slept nights thinking about how they're going to hold on to their people and, and worry about keeping those people in those jobs because we're a family in tourism and, and, and that's how a lot of tourism businesses work. And let's be honest about it, you know, a core value of Irish tourism is our people. That's who delivers the welcome, that's who breathes life into uh, the experiences that we offer. So again, as part of what we're suggesting uh, in terms of recommendations um, within the report that we've launched today, it's critical that we make sure that we're supporting the upskilling and the reskilling of people at this time. And, and there's real opportunity now that we can actually take the time to invest further in our people, but it has to be government supported, uh, linked to business, to keeping our people connected uh, to business. And I suppose one of the, the other things to remember as well, you know, this economic slowdown has had a significant impact on youth employment. I mean, when you look at the CSO figures, um, you, you look at people of 25 years and under, they're five times more likely to be unemployed as a consequence of this pandemic. And then when you compare that to tourism, one in every two people employed in tourism is under the age of 35. 
So that's, again, we're a significantly young uh, industry and, and we need the energy of those people and all of the fantastic skills that they bring, not just in the craft skills, but, you know, in the marketing, the finance, the management skills. So we have a real opportunity in terms so of, of tackling that. So what are you thinking that. for in terms of the report, you know, the recovery task force? What is the, the ask or the expectation? Um, because obviously... You know, if, if not if 2021 is a write-off, but obviously if it's going to, be, our expectations are going to be much smaller. What are the things that we need to be doing mm. now in order to prepare for that recovery? Uh, well, what we are doing, and, and to be, you're quite right, in the Tourism Recovery Task Force, this was an area no more than in our own report that we focus in uh, extensively. And, and of course, Fall to Ireland are very much playing their role in terms of delivering um, education and upskilling and training at the moment uh, through their COVID hub. But what we actually need is a cohesive plan to uh, maintain lifelong learning for people in our industry. Uh, we need to develop a platform and, and digital, look at what digital has done in terms of transforming how we've all stayed connected, etc. But if we have a, a digital platform that we can now allow people to upskill and to become trained and educated in other areas so that they, they don't lose confidence. And that's another thing I suppose that people have mentioned. You know, people haven't been working as frequently uh, and, and with the open enclosures or whatever else. People start to lose confidence so we need now to help build that confidence by providing educational platforms and by making sure that we make it easy we've got to make it easy for people to get access to all of the great educational opportunities that are out there in tourism i know that a lot of the report was trying to to focus on that on the hope and the confidence and it's kind of when you reel back the years even further than <laughs> the one that we've had like when you look back to uh, 9-11, when you look back to, um, and, and you grimace at each one, to foot and mouth, you know, to the global financial crisis. Um, tourism and hospitality always takes a big hit in terms of jobs initially, yeah. but it also leads out fairly That's quickly right. when that happens. Um, are you confident in the, the, the resilience um, of, of the sector? Because there are some factors inside of your control and some entirely outside of it. Exactly. But I, I think as a word, if ever there was a word that described tourism industry and tourism people, it is resilient. My goodness, as you say, just some of those things <laughs> that you've mentioned there. And I've lived my life in tourism through many of them from international tourism uh, attacks or tourism, <laughs> yeah. no, from international terrorist attacks to 9-11 um, uh, to going back to foot and mouth and even you know, the greatest impact of the financial crisis. We've mapped out actually, it's very interesting when you see it in the report today, how we continue as an industry to bounce back and, you know, the period of time that it takes. But the one thing that, that I've really noticed over all of those years is we always seem to be able to bounce back better. Mm -hmm. um, and we always innovate and, and that awful word that we're all fed up listening to is pivoting. Um, but we, we Which do should that. be banned after yeah, Absolutely, this. <laughs> it should be banned the after word that. pivoting should be banned. But you know, it is incredible the way the tourism industry can actually uh, adapt and reinvent itself. And I, I've seen so much of that in the last number of months. I can't tell you how hard people have worked to actually reimagine their businesses and how they deliver their experiences because they're looking for new revenue streams. They have a whole new audience because some of them don't have uh, or haven't had uh, as much domestic business and it's, it's a very different market. Um, uh, and we have a unique um, product offering across the island in many respects, but we also have unique vulnerabilities by mm -hmm. virtue of um, our connectivity. We'll be chatting later on to Mark Crothel from the Scottish uh, Tourism Alliance and, you know, very close to us, uh, very, yes. very similar markets in very yes, many indeed. respects, but very, very different mm -hmm. as well because of their, their, they don't have as much reliance as we do That's right. on that international um, connectivity. And as you said earlier, the domestic market can yeah. never um, o overtake that. And you know, when you look at some of the, the messaging and the narratives um, that have been coming out, particularly, you know, when people are out negotiating contracts and pricing and everything, um, what is the message we've been sending out and does it need to, to you know, to be fortified, more unified? In terms of the message that we're sending into the international yes, markets? Yes, into, into, yeah. into those source markets that are so critical for us. Yes, uh, and, and look at, as I say, we're doing all that we can to make sure that the pilot light stays alive there. And Tourism Ireland have been doing a phenomenal job because it, it's, it's not easy. You know, we can't be overtly out there saying, come back to Ireland, but we can send out messages and we're doing it exceptionally well and saying, 
you know, through that dream phase and when the time is right and you come back, here's what we can offer you. Um, and, and you know what, our international trade, and I can, I can speak from a personal experience for the ITOA members, um, they are so supportive and everybody is in this together. This is truly a global issue. And we are working so hard uh, in making sure that when, when recovery comes, Ireland will be the forefront of people's minds. You know, we're constantly sending them out uh, ideas, new opportunities. Um, we're reinventing how we're delivering uh, the Ireland message. So to be frank, we're, we're hearing very positive soundings and all of the research that Tourism Ireland are doing in the international markets, they continue to show that Ireland is right up there. People want to come back um, for a revisit. Even in terms of those who haven't been here yet, they absolutely still see Ireland as on that bucket list. Yeah, and it will be interesting to see what the profile, um, we'll maybe chat Won't later uh, with the panel about yeah. what the profile of the, yeah. the, travel, uh, the future traveller will look like, because I know a lot of us might want to get a chance to spend a little bit more time at home before we uh, um, get away. Um, we'll obviously talk um, later on th throughout the morning about um, quarantine and specific measures um, and there is a lot of debate um, and a lot of very conflicting debate, well intended, but a lot of conflicting um, debate about that. But as you do know, I will be speaking shortly to uh, Minister Catherine Martin, who has got a very broad and demanding um, portfolio. And obviously t tourism has been sometimes um, in departmental terms, a bit of an orphan. It, it kind of gets <laughs> moved about a bit. Um, it was previously with transport, That's I suppose, right. which, which, which was of some assistance. Um, but where do you see, um, you know, because one argument might be, well, look, tourism isn't as big as perhaps some aspects of the services sector, not as big as FDA, but where do you feel that should fit in a, from a resource and an exchequer or just departmental perspective going, going forward? Yeah. That's another phrase that should be banned going forward. <laughs> Can't believe I said it. Well, we don't go backwards, that's for sure. So I think we'll keep the forward one for the time being. But look, at needless to say, we're delighted that, uh, that Minister Martin is joining us here this morning. And, and to be fair, um, what a time she actually took up the role uh, in, in, in her new department, uh, of which tourism is a part of. And, and to be fair to her, you know, we were a month into the Tourism Recovery Task Force uh, work when she joined and we were one of her first meetings in, in, in the first four days of her taking up uh, her office. And, and she has been nothing but encouraging and supportive in that respect. Uh, her officials have been tremendous in terms of getting that piece of work uh, over the line. And, and bear in mind, tourism is the first industry and it was the first one out of the blocks to actually have a recovery task force um, put Amor, in place. just speak to me a little bit um, about the task force. Where are we um, at present? What's been done? What's left to do? Well, obviously, you know, it, it was a significant piece of work done in a very short period of time. Uh, and the minister was very anxious to have the report in full finished by the end of September in advance of, of the of October the budget. budget. Um, and in all credit to her, because she took that report, she put it under her arm and she brought it to cabinet. Um, and certainly it is the roadmap with 33 recommendations. And again, you'll see that there's a lot of synergy between our recommendations and, and, and of that of the TRT report. There is a recovery oversight group formed of which I, I sit on and Noreen Hegarty. I'm sure you know yes, Noreen, a colleague of yours, uh, is chairing that. The minister appointed her in December. So we are now charged with making sure that those recommendations that were put forward and need to be implemented over the next three years are going to happen. Um, but just back to where tourism fits. Um, obviously, I'm not going to, to lie and, and, and nobody in the industry uh, would be surprised to hear me say that, you know, we felt that we were not put in the right department when the reshuffling of departments was done in this particular government. Uh, there had been great expectation and hope and I think even the Tornish to himself has alluded to the fact that the expectation is that we would have been in the Department for Trade, Employment uh, and, and Investment. And, and why wouldn't we? because we are an export industry. So we absolutely are vital uh, in terms of international trade. In terms of enterprise, we have 20, over 20,000 enterprises, the length and breadth uh, of, of this country. Do you um, worry that, that, that um, a certain proportion of those will fail, even with everything? 
Look, I, of course we worry about that, and I think there's a certain inevitability, uh, not just in tourism, but, you know, in other sectors too, where th there will be... We've already had some high-profile losses. We have, but really, you know, our job uh, in ITIC and, of course, across the tourism industry is to keep the shoulders to the wheel and really battle to get as many businesses over the survival line and into recovery. And, and we think it's absolutely doable, provided we get those measures and policies to support yeah. us. And I know it has been absolutely um, relentless what for you um, personally has been sort of the hardest yard so so far? Like, well, what, what was your, your you know, oh. Owen kind of speaking earlier about being <laughs> in that meeting with his colleagues just kind of going when they realised actually, you know, like when I mean, there's no St. Patrick's Day this year, perhaps we didn't expect that, but I think there, it would be fair to say there was a lot of expectation mm. that we might get something of after the the unfortunately phrased meaningful Christmas, but there had been hope, I think, certainly of some oh. class of a meaningful summer. Absolutely. Uh, no, there absolutely had. And um, as I say, even when we look forward with the complexities now that we understand around vaccine rollout um, and, of course, the virulent strains that we would be very concerned about as well, which is understandable. And I think, you know, all of the right actions have been taken. I think we will know more about where we might be by the end of March. Uh, I, I think it's a bit soon to be making any decisions. But there's absolutely no doubt that in terms of international travel, uh, we're Q3 at Q3. of later this year, do you think that that could be potentially the, the um, a little bit of an opening up? Obviously, the, the international market is a, a longer season. Absolutely, the... yeah. And, and as I say, you know, initially, I suppose, if we look back to the middle of December, there was great hope that yeah. we would be by H2 uh, looking at recovery starting. But realistically, we are looking at Q3 at this point in time. Yeah. And it's going to be a huge disappointment for, for many. But as you said, it's such a dynamic thing because even with the, the hope, we'll be speaking to Luke O'Neill later about um, yeah. vaccines and, and everything else. But even with that, it hasn't yet proved to be the silver bullet yet, perhaps, no. than no. That, that, that we had hoped. It's taking more time than we would have hoped, obviously, international travel. But, you know, we can use this time, Derville, and we must use this time, and government must use it in terms of their discussions uh, with their European leaders to make sure that we have a robust testing regime, that we have have the traffic light system honed to be ready and have a travel safe passport that people will give have huge confidence once once they know exactly where they stand and, and, and they know what tests are going to be required and we need a global approach to this we can't have a bit of this and, and, bit of that. and even you know it's, it's it's interesting this morning we were working up to headlines about a cautious opening of the mm. Irish economy um, across the water across the RC they're opening up to uh, 10 days or 10 years right. um, with very very different headlines um, yeah. in the UK, is it a sort of a lament that um, whatever about European or international cooperation that we haven't been able to get um, a, a, a double island approach? It is, of course. And, and you know, uh, the one thing that tourism is, is an all island approach. And it really is uh, helpful when we work and move together as one. And, and really, I think it's going to be critical. And I would really hope that uh, the light will be seen and that, you know, the politicians will actually uh, do what's right for business and yeah. do what's right for the people in the industry. Um, what's striking about um, your, the board that you chair and indeed many um, other institutions around the country is that um, it's, it's a voluntary led board. You're all putting the shoulder <laughs> to the wheel, um, um, but in your own time, how has it been from that perspective from the last 12 months? Obviously the industry, there's been a huge pulling together to try and get things Absolutely, over yeah. the line. Look at the collaboration has been, uh, you know, just incredible uh, across the industry. And I suppose from my own perspective, uh, who would ever have thought I'd be taking over the chairmanship of ITIC and I suppose the voice of the industry at, in such turbulent times. So look at it, it's, it, I, I know this may sound strange, it has been a privilege to be that person uh, leading the industry. I won't say it hasn't been exhausting because, of course, having taken on the chairmanship of ITIC, that kind of led me into having to take on the chairmanship of the Tourism Recovery Task Force. So it was a lot on one plate when you're trying to keep all the wheels spinning and the day jobs going as well. And, and all credit to the organisations with whom I work, who really came behind me and totally supported me. But. You know, I, I, I do think back to the last time I, I did an event with Etic and everybody was worrying about over tourism. There wasn't <laughs> enough hotel rooms. And then you come around this time and it just, it just goes, it's, you know, I remember Mars Pratt kind of previously saying that, <laughs> but that was the time then to really, you yes. know, um, to get ourselves ready. Yeah. I know that you very much did want to end on, um, 
on a note of hope because it has been very, very difficult for everyone. So even with the worst and best case scenarios, even with all of those demands that you have, just I know you'll be joining me later on for the award, but just tell me what, what is your kind of message to, to those who are at home? And they're joining us, I think, in their thousands this morning um, and thank you for doing so. But what is your, your, your message to them? Look, my message is, uh, I suppose, A, just to say that I, I so admire uh, the people of this industry who have really uh, struggled in, in the worst of business environments. And congratulations to all of you. Look, keep the faith, keep working together, come behind this report. If we manage uh, through the next uh, year, I am absolutely confident that tourism has a very bright future. There are better days ahead and we are all going to be there to enjoy them. Well, listen, thank you, Ruth. I know you're going to be back with me later on to reveal the winner. I know who it is, but I can't say, <laughs> so I'll just hold it for there. But thank you, and we'll speak to you shortly. Thank you, Ruth. Thanks, Terrible. The first maps didn't look like much, but when people started to explore beyond the known to the wonders unknown, the maps began to grow, and so did their world. Wandering strange new lands, crossing the seven seas. And even when they thought the map was finished, there was even more to explore. Ireland, keep discovering. Well, few people perhaps have weathered as many storms as Willie Walsh, who stepped down as IAG Chief Executive last September after 15 years at the helm. He did contemplate retirement, but less than six months later, he's off to Geneva to take up the role of Director General of the International Air Transport Association. Well, earlier this week, I caught up with Willie Walsh to talk about recovery in the tourism and aviation sectors and the next steps we need to take. Here's a little bit of what he had to say. Flying is safe. Uh, you know, we've argued as an industry that pre-flight testing uh, is an important step. I, I think it's it's a pity that that wasn't embraced earlier. You know, some jurisdictions did embrace it where you had to have demonstrated that you had a, a coronavirus test before you traveled. And I think that's, that's a good move. That helps to reassure people. And going forward, I think some form of vaccine passport, I, I'm not a particular fan of it, but I think that is going to be part of the solution as well, that people will be able to demonstrate, you know, that when they're traveling internationally, no different than, you know, we used to have to prove we had yellow fever injections or typhoid, you know, that, that th this will be part of the, the future for a period of time. Um, but the great thing about it is the industry, from an aviation point of view, is ready to recover. You know, it, it, it is ready and it's willing. And even more importantly, everything shows that when you can travel, the demand is there. So I don't worry about the underlying demand uh, because once people are told, you know, the green light, you can travel, it, it'll pick up very quickly. And everybody wants to get back to normal uh, and travel tourism is a critical part of that. I, I think the signal that came out of Ireland was very worrying. You know, Ireland has always traded on the basis of our, you know, the, the, the island of welcome. You, you know, you're, we want people to, to travel to Ireland and you're always going to be, be welcome when you do that. I, I think the message that went out was very different. It was stay away, we don't want to see you. you know, we're worried that you're going to be diseased. Don't come near us. I think we've got a big job to do to, you know, to recover from that. I'm not sure that our island economy would have enabled us to shut it down in the same way as Australia. You know, we're so dependent on trade outside of Ireland. We're so dependent on tourism, on external investment, foreign direct investment. You know, we're not like Australia. Uh, so our island is different to other islands. And I think we've got to recognize that. So some of the things they did, which make very, much sense for them would not have made sense for us and, and therefore i think we have to have a, an irish solution to what is an irish problem if we had to do this again what would we do differently um and you know there has to be an all-island solution you can't have a situation whereby you have restrictions flying into ireland and open access into northern ireland that just doesn't work when you've got people with free access across the border so you know, that it's never going to work. You can't, uh, you know, politically, this is a huge challenge and I recognise that. But logistically, if you don't have the same rules applying on the full island, you know, you're, you're, you're wasting time, money and effort 
uh, and you're fooling you're, you know you're fooling everybody believing that it will be a solution it won't some people will think that the emphasis on environmental issues may have eased a bit uh, i don't think so i think it's going to be more important than ever i think the challenge for the aviation industry you know, particularly for airlines is going to be greater than it's ever been uh, the industry is going to have to demonstrate that it has a credible path to sustainability in the medium and long term the short term there's not a lot that the industry can do i think it's been doing everything uh, that has been within its control uh, i suppose one of the uh, advantages is that we've seen a lot of older aircraft retired uh, so you know the efficiency of the aircraft flying uh, in 2021 and 2022 will be significantly greater than what we had in 2019 so that is a positive but more work will need to be done and it's going to be very important that everybody in the industry is honest about this because uh, you know it's a huge challenge uh, the change in political leadership in the US uh, you know will will make it a an area of focus in the US as well you know so this will be absolutely critical for all of us to be clear about our role what it is we can do to do everything possible within our control and to be proactive. You know, we can't wait for uh, legislation to be forced upon us. We should be embracing this. We should want to do better for all of our, our, our sakes. But uh, yeah, I see this as, as absolutely critical. It's one of the things that actually spurred me to take on the role in IATA because uh, I have been passionate about this within the industry, within the aviation industry. Uh, and I think we're gonna have to do even better going forward than we have done in the past. What does the Irish government need to be doing now to get us back to some semblance? It might be some while before we get back to 2019 and those record levels of, of tourists coming to Ireland. But what is your key message or what are you behoving her and her cabinet colleagues to do today? Work with us. You know, we, we are part of the solution. Uh, we are an incredibly flexible, resilient segment of the economy. We've demonstrated that we will be part of the rebuilding. We will be part of the economic recovery, but you've got to work with us. You've got to support us. You know, this is a time to support the tourism industry, uh, to work with us, to generate jobs, to generate economic recovery. And we'll only do it if we're working together. And you can see the full 30 minute interview with Wally Walsh on the ITIC website and you don't want to miss it. He reflects on the ups and downs of a 41 year career in aviation and talks to me about missing walks about in Dublin and missing pints in McDade's. He's really missing the pints in McDade's. Well, look, I'm joined now by Minister Catherine Martin, TD, Minister for Tourism, Culture, Arts, Gaeltacht, Sport and Media. You're very, very welcome, Minister. I always feel like I need to take a breath when I'm describing the, your brief, your <laughs> title. <laughs> it takes some time to even say it. So what is it even like trying to manage a portfolio of, of that? I, I know every time I talk to you, I ask you this question, but how do you manage a portfolio with so many entities and demands within it? Good, good morning, Darbo. Uh, delighted to, to join you today. Um, I guess it, it is a big portfolio, but the, the, the key is it, it all makes sense, um, actually, and it's very much connected. And I think that's going to be the, the, the key that I've identified to, to be effective. Um, you know, the job is obviously very, very challenging. Um, there's no doubt about that. And everything from, you know, tourism to arts to, to, to sport to the Gaelthoft, um, you know, it's very much uh, reliant on, on people gathering and um, and all are um, devastated. Um, but, and very much, I suppose, those under my remit are, are the worst affected and, and the first shut and, and uh, will be the last to reopen. Um, but it's it's my job um, to 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 work and um, just listen to the, the previous contri contribution. It's it's the engagement with with um, the stakeholders that they, they are part of the solution, and I absolutely identify that. I, I guess as a as a, a person, as Catherine Martin, um, I'm someone um, who works well uh, in challenging circumstances, and um, that that that'd be you know part of who I am. Um, I'm 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 very determined sort of person, uh, tenacious and and persistent and I, I am I'm a fighter and and I think that's what you know um to given today um and those who are listening and who are under you know severe personal and, and financial um so, you know 
circumstances and severity uh, of the, 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 the devastation that is COVID, I'm, I'm fighting for you. Um, and and I, I think I, I, I'll do what I can, but I absolutely get that engagement. Um, and, you know, my very first day here, Derville, um, when I walked into this office, I asked for, for a meeting with the Tourism Recovery Task Force. Um, and that was my, my first engagement uh, uh, as a minister. And I wanted to signal um, and I hope everyone that's listening today realises how, how much I, I know you need the support um, to s not just survive, but to, 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 to recover on, on the far side. And I'm, I'm determined to, to do that. And of course, there is a big synergy because it's not just the 160,000 job losses, the 20,000 you know, companies that we've heard, but also that multiplier effect for what I suppose we've worked very hard on the last couple of years, the experience economy, which does include your culture, it does include everything else. And, and obviously all those ancillary jobs, I'm thinking of, you know, companies that are making, you know, duvets and covers and, and just supplying all of those industries. The, the scale is quite big. Um, we were just talking about, you know, the different headlines in Ireland and the UK this morning. They're quite different, but um, but last night your colleague, Leo Vradka, the Taunus, just seemed to um, put to bed any notion that we would have uh, an international tourism recovery, um, certainly in the first half of this year, that if there's going to be anything, it's going to be domestic only. And I know obviously tourism falls within a lot of different briefs in terms of its impacts, but mm -hmm. what is your own thinking um, this morning, Minister, on recovery in the tourism sector? Um, yeah, I, 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 I'd be re reasonably optimistic about recovery in, in, I suppose, in the domestic economy. Having said that, I'm acutely aware that 75% of the, the, the tourism economy is the international um, um, tourist. Uh, so, um, I, I, I think we, we, our focus now is on suppressing the virus and, and making sure that that, that domestic tourism um, is, is, as, is as, as best as it can be uh, in, in the summer. I think what's different, if you think of where we were as a nation this time last year, people were, were planning holidays abroad. Um, that is not the case. So I, I would hope to see a, a stronger domestic tourism um, and, and those staycations really uh, increase this year but again as i said you know it's 180,000 jobs are, are vulnerable or at risk and, and that international tourism economy is 75 percent um but we we are working on it and we will be ready to go the, the key is there'll be no cliff edge um and i've um worked with minister donahue and with the tarnish on, on this and there'll be no cliff edge for, for this industry um, and it's about putting the right supports in place to to survive making the most of the domestic economy but of course it's no replacement for the, the international tourist um, we're also but, in the process um, of um minister producing legislation that will encompass mandatory quarantine the tarnish talked about you know difficulties with that from a constitutional law perspective from freedom of movement not least complicated by and we're both border girls, but not least complicated by the common mm -hmm. travel um, area. Are you disappointed at reports, um, Minister, that 60% of people who are coming into Dublin Airport are in fact Irish holiday makers who have, um, who have gone on holiday, that there are still significant numbers of people who are not following the advice that the vast majority of the population um, are adhering to? Um, well, of course, because you'd hope for for solidarity, um, and so the, the when when it, when a nation and and so many um, businesses are are suffering and, and people are going through that financial and personal hardship. Um, but um, I, I, you, you have to have optimism um, too. Um, but then there's the job of, 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 of government to it. And um, our, our primary ob objective has to be to, to minimise the introduction of, of new cases. Um, to the state from from other um, locations, um, and with regard to to inbound tourism, that that is quite difficult right now. Um, but um, we, you know, there will be stronger measures put in place. I I, I think that's the, the way the government is moving right now, Derville. Um, and for for this industry and for all those who are, who are, are listening now, we, we will be be ready to to go and promote Ireland as soon as as the time is right, and that's where our, our focus is on. And I know tourism Ireland. I've made sure they're adequately resourced, and and they're they're working on on that too. 
There is no lack of recommendations um, in the ITIC report that uh, you will have received, but I suppose um, if there's two major issues that they've highlighted, one is um, the urgent rollout of the vaccine and the other is the restoration of international connectivity. And obviously that is huge. It, it does try, um, you know, encompass other ministers, of course, but on those two issues, um, what do you think um, can be done there that we could get some class of a meaningful summer, even if it is only for the domestic market? So you're just thought um, well, look at, do, do you think we should have the antigen testing? Should we be in? Do you support, for example, the stronger measures um, looking at mandatory quarantine for certain passengers? Just I, there's a couple of questions there in relation in relation to the vaccination. What I can say is, you know, we're 50 days in, into the vaccination rollout. We have uh, just over 230,000 doses administered. It would be the hope by the end of March uh, we would be nearing 600,000. It would be hope by the end of April and May we'll be at maybe the, the one million mark, which is what you know is one third of of the of who we intend to 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 vaccinate. Um, and, you know, the Taoiseach himself has said that towards that mid-year, it will certainly be a different space, I think a different um, landscape altogether. Um, and, you know, with, you know, we could be looking at um, Johnson & Johnson, the, that authorisation, you know, maybe by, by the end of February. So, so all of this gives us, gives us hope in relation to, to the, the, the vaccination. In relation to connectivity, the, the government remains absolutely committed to ensuring that the aviation sector um, can maintain the necessary core um, cap capability to, to retain that strategic um, con connectivity and, and is, is ready to quickly rebound when, when the time is right to do so. Um, and, you know, as I said, I, I have ensured that Tourism Ireland and they're doing great work is adequately resourced to, to go back into the marketplace. Um, you know, there, there'll be strong competition, um, but we should not forget um, wh who we are as a nation and, and how attractive we are to, 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 to the US um, and to, to other countries. And that hasn't gone away. And, and there's pent up um, uh, will, willingness uh, abroad to come back to Ireland for, for family, never mind uh, for, for, for those who want to holiday. And, and, and that, that, that remains there. So our job is to make sure we're ready when that, when that happens and we're working on that. I mean, so there's, a, there's a lot of debate um, and depend on which side of the zero COVID um, uh, spectrum you are. You know, a lot of people will say that there's been a closed sign over Ireland. Um, uh, others will kind of say that we didn't shut down early enough in terms of our airports. Looking back now and looking to what other jurisdictions, you know, South Korea, New Zealand, etc. Um, is there anything when you look back at this part of the crisis that we could have done differently? Particularly given the Look, measures I, the UK government is now taking in terms of quarantines and, and hotels and restricting access to its airspace. Well, we, we are moving in that direction now. Um, uh, hindsight is, is a great thing, but I think we, we have to look forward now and, and do what, what is best. We are very concerned about the high incidence of, of the virus in, in many countries and, and reasons and regions and the, the potential, you know, it's, it's such an uncertain thing, COVID. I often say a week is a long time in politics, but it's a very long time uh, with, with COVID as well. And um, so it's just, I, I think it's essential we, we restrict travel into the country to, to a minimum. Um, you know, we've effectively banned uh, travel from South Africa and Brazil, and including suspending um, uh, any visa-free travel for, from those countries. And um, you, you also have, you know, the mandatory quarantine at hotel for 14 days for, for those who arrive from the country. Um, I think the PCR test is the most reliable of, of, of the tests, and that's, that's, what, we, that's what we're using. So, um, you know, I, I, it's, it's uncertain times, but we're, we're, we're doing our best uh, to, because the main emphasis is on suppressing the virus so that we have the hope of, of recovering. And is there a concern that there may be a little bit of forum shopping, as it were, going on, people using Dublin as a hub to, you know, to get into the UK? Are you concerned at, at reports that perhaps people are using us as a gateway to get into the UK? Or do you, are you sure, are you happy that the government has a handle on that? Um, well, I, I, I think the, the Tánaiste indicated um, yesterday, you know, we were looking at the developments in the UK. So, you know, the... the, the the two, two island strategy may be something that needs to be explored. We have to explore all options, Derville, uh, to, to, to protect us um, and, and also with those who are watching today to, to protect this industry, industry to make sure it has the potential, it's, it's rightly placed to, to, to recover.
Yeah. Can I speak to you, Minister, about um, the last budget? And I know that um, ITIC and the TRT got into you uh, in time before that budget was delivered. Um, and uh, I suppose there's the key issues. There, there are the supports. And, and the, earlier today, Ruth uh, Andrews did acknowledge the, um, the extensive supports. But there were two risks. If, you know, we can acknowledge perhaps that the last budget, to the extent that it could be, given all the demands, was pro-tourism. One of the big sticking issues is VAT. And when you speak to particularly hoteliers at the minute who are negotiating pricing for 2022-2023, they are saying they need a two to three year and possibly a further lead in. Um, you're the minister who's championing tourism. Are you in speaking to Pascal Donoghue to the Taoiseach saying, I know it's not my brief, but I need three to five years for this. Are you fighting on the VAT front? Um, well, that, that is the, the budget, uh, re budgetary uh, negotiation process, you know, um, and the reduction from the, the 13.5% to 9% that we achieved um, in the, the last budget, it is the, more, the most targeted and most focused um, and the, of most benefit to this sector. Uh, what I can say is I'm, I'm, I'm very aware of that and um, my focus is on that. Um, so that's, that would be my, my, my message here. And I, I have that uh, very good working relationship, as I've said, with, with Minister Donoghue um, and, and with the Thonisha too. Uh, but do you, do you accept, I suppose, that tension in the industry that their multi-year planning, they have to look ahead, they're looking for that kind of certainty and I suppose maybe just that vulnerability around every year the budget coming in that because even with the best of intentions, if we don't have an international market this year, the VAT rate mightn't be of benefit in this fiscal year, but it may actually be to next year and to 2023 and further on to recovery, that that will, re will really be when it's required. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely understand the, the, the call for this. Um, and I, as I said, that, that is where, where my, my, my focus is, because I see the, the, the absolute benefit it is. Um, it's a targeted benefit for, for, for this industry. Um, the, I, I, I'm working on, on the other supports too. Only, only last week, the, the 55 million um, for, for Falcha Ireland. I, I think the, the COVID restriction support scheme as well, overseen by Minister Donoghue, that I, I, I linked in with him and that. And actually, tourism and hospitality sector account for two thirds of, of the payments um, of that, which is up to 155 million euro. So I think it's all the horizontal supports. Um, I, as I said, my focus is on the back, but it's all the supports. That, that this uh, industry needs, um, and 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 key to that is my is is me listening and engaging uh, and hearing uh, the calls, and that's what I as I said, that's what I did from day one in this ministry, and I, and I will continue to to do so. That uh, the tourism oversight group um, that I that I set up on foot of the, the report and recommendations, um, is due to have its third meeting and will present its report shortly to me, um, and. You know, as I said at the time, uh, when when the, the recovery task force were meeting Derville, I, I made the recommendation to them to get it to me before the budget. That 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 that's what helps me as your minister, and this report uh, will be very helpful too in informing me and and in helping me to, to fight for this uh, industry. Um, and what is the manoeuvre? I, I have this vision of you surrounded by gatekeepers from all the different sectors, culture, media, everything coming at you because everybody wants sector specific supports that they're that they're crying out for and I'm just wondering what is the capacity for that when a lot of the measures that have been introduced in Ireland and elsewhere have been crude but effective measures you, you wouldn't need, you wouldn't introduce them in ordinary times let's just maybe put it that way so that is, is that a very difficult thing to to I suppose withstand that constant demand for sector specific and are you sympathetic though to them uh, it, it's 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 not difficult for me to withstand it uh, because that's my my job. Um, where I find it difficult is the, the heartbreaking stories of, of all of those in my, my in my sector. But that makes me, I suppose, e even more de determined to help them. And as I said, I think one of the advantages uh, of of my broad remit is um, how they can work together and the joined up up thinking and where the artistic can help the, 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 the touristic or the culture and sport, how they can all work together, uh, how they can promote uh, rural Ireland and, and regional tourism as well. And I see that, that connection. So supports I'm putting in place for tourism may help the arts, supports I'm putting in place for arts may help the, the tourism. And I have to constantly think like that as well. 
Um, but I wouldn't look for any sympathy uh, as as the minister. It's my job, and I, 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 I to 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 work hard for those who who are feeling, um, as I said, the personal and, and financial hardship. Um, so my my thoughts and my focus is on helping helping those, and um, I'm I'm resilient, and as I said, I I, I am a fighter. Um, and 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 I, I'm doing my best to make sure it's not just about survival, but it's it's about the I I, I see into the far side. I'm looking to the year of the gathering, for example, and thinking, let's be ambitious. I'm being optimistic. What can we make out of that? And how can the arts and the sports sports connects to the bed nights, uh, for example? So um, I, I'm forward looking. Um, so obviously, in the moment, the supports, but you have to have that optimism and see beyond where we are now. Do you see that role of maintaining connectivity, international routes? Because after all of this, there is going to be fierce, fierce competition um, for those routes, for those slots. Um, is that a priority for you in terms of connectivity? I know it, it obviously crosses with the, the transport minister, but that is going to be key um, for our recovery um, into the future, maintaining that connectivity. And I, I noted your colleague, uh, Housing Minister uh, Darrow Brown on Monday, saying that it will be quite some time before that international connectivity opens up. But from your point of view, that must be critical. Is that something that you're working closely with Eamon Ryan on? that fight to get yeah, those slots in and, the future. And I, yes, sir, well, I, I am absolutely to, to maintain that um, uh, connectivity and the government is determined to do that. And, and obviously it helps that um, myself and Eamon are party colleagues uh, uh, as well. And we're only chat chatting about this um, yesterday. Um, but, you know, I, you know, Tourism Ireland has actually done research on this and, and indicates that the tourists do want to return to, to Ireland. The research has been done when the time is right. and. We have to be sure that we're ready to capitalise on 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 that when it comes. Um, so you know, I think research from Tourism Ireland even shows that people are ready to come to us by by the end of of this year. So I wouldn't, you know, we don't have to rule out 2021 yet if that's what the research has shown. And there is an appeal actually um, of a mix of the the city and the rural um, fr from those from, who want to come back to us. I suppose it's really about the the, the vaccines. It's the, the key part. In, in, in this is, is the vaccine rollout. Um, but, you know, the same tourism and research show, shows that key target countries like, like France and the UK and Germany are found when those who plan to take the vaccine, around half of them said that they'd resume travel, um, which is, you know, as, as, as soon as they're vaccinated. So there, there's the hope again, if that's what the research is, is shown. But obviously it will be the domestic tourism that will re recover first. Um, and in relation to domestic tourism, I would say one thing of note, uh, I, I think for, for everyone in this industry is the, the, the change or what we're noticing about uh, savings um, and Central Bank of Ireland to report an increase in 13 billion in, in household savings. Um, and I, I think there is a, a pent up d d demand there. And when those so some would argue that they translate into, into uh, tourism um, businesses, uh, that's where oh, we'll see the oh, growth. Well can I ask you, Minister, and some would say perhaps that level of record hold or that level of record uh, household savings might actually prove a little bit of a risk. So we're afraid of what might happen when that pent up demand comes out. But there was a question I wanted to ask you about just, um, and I know we've only a couple of minutes left with you, but listening to that um, interview with Willie Walsh and Full just before he heads off to Geneva and to Atta um, was fascinating. He um, talks about the risks, real risks of consolidation in the aviation sector. And you know, there's going to be a lot of winners and losers. Um, um, people will be happy to hear that he predicts that Ryanair and Aer Lingus will survive and thrive, but he, he doesn't have that same outlook for many other airlines. And he does raise that issue about the need to be competitive on connectivity. But you'll have just heard on the last piece of his interview, we obviously just uh, gave you some excerpts. One of his key concerns is sustainability. Um, and perhaps in the midst of this crisis, we haven't really been thinking about that because it's just been about surviving and trying to see beyond the next quarter, the next half year, and just you know getting those supports to people. But sustainability in Irish tourism is going to be something that would be really important, not least because consumers are going to demand that. Uh, absolutely, and, I, and with my my green hat hat on, um, you know and. That, that obviously is something you know. I, I negotiate in Intergovern, for example, the sustainable tourism policy and the, the longer stays um, initiative and the tourism recovery. One one of the recommendations, uh, you know, the plan recommends that schemes 
which promotes sustainable tourism, both at enterprise level and at consumer level, should be identified for the recovery. So I, I as uh, Minister, um, see the, the, the amazing potential in this, just as he does, you know, uh, to promote green destinations, to promote, it's what we can do well, you know, it's, it's, what, it's, it's our brand, it's what's unique to us. Uh, the longer stays, the eco and the agri-tourism, the, the, the link to com accommodation destinations, um, to, to, to local agri-food and tourism attractions, our beautiful greenways, our, our walkways. And in the Programme for Government, we're looking at developing uh, a lovely, um, from, from Cardenford Lock to, to, to Cove, there's so much potential there. And I think there's a paradigm shift in thinking in what the demand will be actually for this. Um, so include, Minister, um, I, I, I think it makes assets. sense and we... Could Sorry? that include state assets uh, that perhaps are underutilised? Perhaps you know, um, you know, uh, you know, parks, forest, other areas that perhaps could be utilised for even for the domestic market. I know that's more of a longer term play, but in terms of sustainable tourism, are there other assets, uh, underused assets, that we're not um, exploiting enough? Well, I, I think we have to explore everything because there, it's. It's, we see it everywhere and I think as you said even in domestic tourism we don't explore it enough and that, that's what we saw in the promotion of staycations last year that so many people's eyes were open uh, to, to what it was. Myself I holidayed along um, you know with the family with Sligo to down to Clare uh, along the Burren uh, taking walks along the cliffs of Moher um, and and and, and, and that, then down to Dingle. There's such beauty there. We have the greatest uh, Beauty and attractions that will that do attract um, tourists from from all over the world, which brings sustainable benefits actually to our rural communities who need that that benefit um, in in offering that that greener Ireland. So you know the wild Atlantic way, but you know as you say, there's others that need to explore, and everything should be explored. I think this is the new way. Uh, I often have that phrase: the recovery can be green, you know. And I think this is this is real has a real part to play in the recovery of of, of tourism. Um, and, finally, and the first thing is that sustainable tourism policy to to get that in place. And finally, Minister, can I just ask you about, um, because a lot of people who will be tuning in will be wondering um, not just about will their businesses survive and thrive, but even if they do, there is a real fear over the loss of that talent. There is a fear that young people, perhaps their parents, if they're choosing their, you know, their, their next steps for college or university or, or their next step after school, they mightn't find tourism and hospitality the, att the attraction it once was. What is kind of that message to those to because it is the biggest indigenous sector that we have but there may be a lot of people who might be afraid to stay in it or indeed to encourage younger people into you know a, a really really important um, sector for the economy yeah well I, I i i i've heard that message loudly and clearly and, and uh, only in recent days i i was talking to my cabinet colleagues in, in government about that and how the retention uh, is key and that experience is built up but um that's where we will we'll look at, I, you, you'll see in the coming weeks, uh, uh, new training programs uh, in upskilling and, and holding on, the digitalization, for example, of, of, of the tourism industry so that we're ready to go. So that's, that's where you'll see the effort go. And already, you know, I, I allocated five million in the budget into that and that's been rolled out already. But retention is key for this industry. And I know there's a risk there and the, the concerns are there, but I'm, I'm, I'm working on that too and I've raised that with uh, my cabinet colleagues. Absolutely. And I'm sure that everyone listening will be grateful to hear that you're fighting for that. And um, I know they'll be harassing you uh, interminably about the VAT rate, but you're, you know that already. So look, uh, Minister, <laughs> I'm going to let you go there. Thank you for joining us. I know you have a very, very uh, busy schedule, but thank you uh, for joining us today. We really um, appreciate it. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. Slán, so slán all the best. Thank you. So look, we are going to take a short break now. We'll be back in 10 minutes, but please, you are a vital part of the conversation. So please do keep your comments coming online using the hashtag ITICConf21. That's I-T-I-C-Conf21. So do stay with us as we will shortly be revealing this year's recipient of the inaugural Eileen O'Mara Walsh Irish Tourism Industry Lifetime Achievement Award. Good morning. I'm delighted to join you all at this important conference on Leading the Tourism Recovery, organised by ITIC and sponsored by AIB. Ireland is known for its beautiful countryside and our warm welcome. The tourism sector welcomed nearly 10 million international visitors here in 2019 and employed about 260,000 people. As you know, COVID-19 has had a severe impact on businesses across the country. 
but I must say that I am constantly inspired by the remarkable agility that business has shown in the face of adversity, adapting premises, managing costs, and coming up with innovative solutions to keep their doors open. We see businesses rapidly moving online and implementing takeaway and delivery models, which have been key to supporting revenues and employment as COVID cases surged and lockdowns were introduced to protect public health. At AIB, we have backed our customers as they adapted to these new ways of working through our many financial solutions and by participating in the SBCI lending support schemes. And we will continue to do so through this very difficult period as we move towards a more normalised trading environment. Now, with the rollout of the vaccines, we can at last see the light at the end of the tunnel. It'll take some time to get there, but there are grounds for hope. When I speak with our customers and study our own AIB card spend data, it's evident that domestic support has been critical to the survival of the industry. Many regional operators generated strong revenues during those summer months in 2020 when restrictions eased, demonstrating the importance of our domestic market. And over the next number of months and years, we look forward to welcoming back international visitors when it is safe to do so. The tourism and hospitality sector is renowned for being resilient. You've overcome the challenges of previous recessions, ash clouds, economic shocks, and now a global pandemic. Each time you've kept going, you've evolved and you've adapted. You've ensured the sustainability of your businesses, your livelihoods, your employees, and the services you offer day in, day out to millions of people. I know this because I see it every day. I hear it from our customers and from our staff who are here to support you on the journey to a sustainable recovery. Thank you, and I hope that you enjoy the conference. I'll never forget the moment when my accountant said, you've got two choices, put the keys on the table and walk away or stay and fight. And here we are 17 years later with a, a great story to tell. When you're faced with a challenge like that event, it's frightening at first. You know, you're, you're a 28 year old, you're, you're, you're overwhelmed by this external factor that you can't control. And you just gotta put the head down and you say, right, I'll work harder every day until I solve this problem. I just wanted to establish Ballygarry to be a, a world-class destination. Um, and we're in the process of that and we're very, very advanced. It has become a lifetime a project to, to get it to where it is today. I mean, we've trebled the footprint of the hotel and we've trebled the net profits. And um, I've done that in a close collaboration with AIB. I think this year was all about acceptance and, and then resilience. And uh, it was about getting on with the, the year that was presented to us. I'm a very fortunate person. I'm a real optimist. No matter how bad yesterday was, I'll jump out of the bed with the two feet on the floor and say, right, let's get today running. We're currently ranked number five of 950 hotels in Ireland. There's four places to go. Let today be a good day. Let me give it my all. Let the shutters up and the customers in. Let me learn to let go, to trust. Let me know when to pull back and when to push on. Let the staff know they're valued. I couldn't do it without them. Let the kids know and be home for bedtime. Right. Let's take that risk. Let's really go for it now. Let's be proud of what we've done. Okay, let's get to work. It takes a certain kind of brave to run a business. We see it, we back it.
Good morning. I'm delighted to join you all at this important conference on leading the tourism recovery, organised by ITIC and sponsored by AIB. Ireland is known for its beautiful countryside and our warm welcome. The tourism sector welcomed nearly 10 million international visitors here in 2019 and employed about 260,000 people. As you know, COVID-19 has had a severe impact on businesses across the country. But I must say that I am constantly inspired by the remarkable agility that business has shown in the face of adversity, adapting premises, managing costs, and coming up with innovative solutions to keep their doors open. We see businesses rapidly moving online and implementing takeaway and delivery models, which have been key to supporting revenues and employment as COVID cases surged and lockdowns were introduced to protect public health. At AIB, we have backed our customers as they adapted to these new ways of working through our many financial solutions and by participating in the SBCI lending support schemes. And we will continue to do so through this very difficult period as we move towards a more normalized trading environment. Now, with the rollout of the vaccines, we can at last see the light at the end of the tunnel. It'll take some time to get there, but there are grounds for hope. When I speak with our customers and study our own AIB card spend data, it's evident that domestic support has been critical to the survival of the industry. Many regional operators generated strong revenues during those summer months in 2020 when restrictions eased, demonstrating the importance of our domestic market. And over the next number of months and years, we look forward to welcoming back international visitors when it is safe to do so. The tourism and hospitality sector is renowned for being resilient. You've overcome the challenges of previous recessions, ash clouds, economic shocks, and now a global pandemic. Each time you've kept going, you've evolved and you've adapted. You've ensured the sustainability of your businesses, your livelihoods, your employees, and the services you offer day in, day out to millions of people. I know this because I see it every day. I hear it from our customers and from our staff who are here to support you on the journey to a sustainable recovery. Thank you, and I hope that you enjoy the conference. I'll never forget the moment when my accountant said, you've got two choices, put the keys on the table and walk away or stay and fight. And here we are 17 years later with a, a great story to tell. When you're faced with a challenge like that event, it's frightening at first. You know, you're, you're a 28-year-old, you're, you're, you're overwhelmed by this external factor that you can't control. And you just got to put the head down and you say, right, I'll work harder every day until I solve this problem. I just wanted to establish Ballygarry to be a, a world-class destination. Um, and we're in the process of that and we're very, very advanced. It has become a lifetime a project to, to get it to where it is today. I mean, we've trebled the footprint of the hotel and we've trebled the net profits. And um, I've done that in a close collaboration with AIB. I think this year was all about acceptance and, and then resilience. And uh, it was about getting on with the, the year that was presented to us. I'm a very fortunate person. I'm a real optimist. No matter how bad yesterday was, I'll jump out of the bed with the two feet on the floor and say, right, let's hit today running. We're currently ranked number five of 950 hotels in Ireland. There's four places to go. Welcome back everyone and thank you for joining us in such great numbers today. I just got an update over the break uh, and you're joining us in your thousands. Thank you so much. Um, I'm joined in the studio once again by Ruth Andrews for what is a very special part of our programme today, that of honouring someone who has made a remarkable contribution to tourism. Ruth, Ittick have decided to name this award after the late, great Eileen O'Mara Walsh. And it just struck me as we gather here today, it's not just one, but it's been two 
great titans of the industry that we lost and even beyond tourism for women, for women in business, for just everything. Eileen O'Mara Walsh was just an unbelievable trailblazer. Oh, she certainly was. I mean, actually, when I when I think of, of both of them and, as you say, the two great leaders that we've lost in the industry over the last uh, 10 months, I can see the both of them together because, you know, that's what this industry was about and that's what Eileen was terrific at. She was terrific at galvanising people and getting people to work together. And of course, that's why she formed Dittick, but she was just uh, a leader of her time and ahead of her time, it has to be said. And we were all so lucky and privileged to have have known her and to have worked with her and to have been a friend of hers as well. Absolutely, and just such an icon for, for women in Ireland, whatever uh, business or sector that Absolutely. they're in. Now, um, I know who it is, but this year's, <laughs> I, I can't say, but this year's recipient um, of the inaugural award will come when you reveal it as absolutely no surprise, Ruth, to anyone who has encountered this person's legendary hospitality and their leadership. Absolutely, Derva, and thank you for that. Uh, it has been an extraordinary year for Irish tourism on so many fronts. Normally at this time of the year, of course, we will be having the ITIC Industry Gala Awards evening to honour the best of Irish tourism, but regrettably, COVID has put pay to that also. However, and most importantly, at this time, we wanted to take this opportunity to present and indeed launch a Tourism Industry Lifetime Achievement Award to a very special recipient, which will continue to be a feature of our awards in the future. The board decided that this award is to be named in memory and honour of the founder of ITIC and twice its chairperson, Eileen O'Mara Walsh. Eileen passed away last April and many of you will remember her as a trailblazer who in the 80s and 90s was to the forefront of Irish tourism's renaissance. She ran her own very successful tour operating business, O'Mara Travel, and as well as founding ITIC, was instrumental in setting up the ITO, ITOA, was a board director of Aer Lingus. She chaired Great Southern Hotels. She was chair and trustee of Dublinia and founder of Heritage Island, Island uh, amongst many other industry roles. She was awarded an honorary doctorate by DIT for her services to tourism also. Eileen was a giant of our industry and we shall mark her death and celebrate her life along as with Eamon's life uh, as soon as it is safe to do so. It is very fitting that today we honour her remarkable legacy with the inaugural Eileen O'Mara Walsh Tourism Industry Lifetime Achievement Award. The, winning of, uh, the winner of the Beautiful Water for Crystal Award this year is well known to all and is a worthy and much admired figure. The recipient has been chosen by the ITIC members and I am delighted to announce that the person to whom we are presenting this inaugural Eileen O'Mara Walsh Tourism Industry Lifetime Achievement Award is none other than Paul Carty. And what a deserved winner he is. Paul retired just last year and has had a stellar tourism career working in senior positions with the Forte Group and Le Meridien in Dublin, London, Bahrain, Singapore and Saudi Arabia. For almost 20 years, he was at the helm of the iconic Guinness Storehouse. And during that time, he trebled its visitor numbers. What makes him truly worthy of this award is that Paul always gave an awful lot back to the industry. He is a previous chairman of ITIC and in 2017 became founding chairman of the Association of Visitor Experience and Attractions and is currently interim chairman, of course, of Fulcher Ireland. Aside from all of those achievements, Paul, as anyone who knows him will testify, is a generous and kind man who has been an inspiration and a mentor to so many of us.
Wow. Good morning, everybody. This is an incredible day in my life. To be awarded this inaugural award is simply amazing. I feel privileged, humbled, and so grateful to ITIC, to the membership of ITIC, and to the judging panel. There are some great leaders who go the extra mile in our industry that we all know about. So many of you, in my opinion, probably deserve this more than I do. I've had a wonderful 40 years in this industry, from 14 years in the UK uh, with Forte Hotels to my nine years overseas with Lemeridian Hotels in the Middle East and Asia. And latterly, my second phase in my life, which was opening the amazing Guinness Storehouse. And this was very special. But it was also a great time in my life because it allowed me the opportunity to get really close um, and indeed support this great tourism industry that we have in Ireland. I always believe and in sharing information, collaboration and giving advice and mentoring and helping each other. I always say to the team that have big shoulders, don't be afraid to support other people. Uh, my first was a foray into tourism when I was the, on the board of ITAS, which is Irish Tourism Assistance, fabulous little gem of an organization. Then I became chair of ITIC for two years uh, under the wonderful Eamon McKeown. And then I was involved with setting up of AVIA, the Association of Visitor Experience and Attractants with Mikey Cunahan. Then I was on the board of Forcha Ireland for four years and I'm now currently uh, interim chair for the past six months. So I've always been, uh, and I believe very much in encouraging others to give back to the industry, give some of your time to give back to the industry. And that has given me so much and enabled me to have a brilliant and enjoyable life. So I've always said that there's never been a single day in my life that I haven't jumped out of bed in the morning and gone to work with a pep in my step, uh, you know, with great anticipation of a day of a great day ahead, even though there has been challenges and there's been tough times with foot and mouth and recessions and all that. But today is very special. Thank you. I just want to say here is this amazing trophy from ITIC that has been presented to me. And thank you again, Ruth, and to everybody. But what makes this award even more special to me is that it is from, it is called the Eileen O'Mara Walsh Award. Eileen was, as you know, a trailblazer. She set up ITIC in the 1980s. She chaired it twice. She set up the ITOA. She chaired numerous boards uh, over the decades, and she broke the glass ceiling for women. A woman before her time, I always said. She passed away far too young. Eileen was many great things, but above all, she was a formidable person that I admired so much, and she was great fun to be with. I loved going on the Heritage Island sojourns around Ireland, North, East, South and West, where we'd visit all the heritage and cultural attractions. And then in the evening time, I had a great pleasure with my wife, Aggie, having dinner with Eileen, and she was a great storyteller, and uh, we just enjoyed her company so much. And these trips became something that I really treasured. Her legacy continues in all her great endeavours. This beautiful award will be proudly displayed, displayed sorry, in my home here in Kinsale, and Eileen will be always in my heart and always in my home. I'm delighted that our passion and legacy is continuing in that our son Owen is the CEO of ITIC and Owen has already taken the organization to even greater heights that Eileen would be so proud of. So thank you all again. I am just thrilled that you've nominated me and then you selected me for this very prestigious award. Thank you from me and from Maggie we are absolutely both thrilled with this. I will celebrate this evening for sure, and I will raise a glass uh, to all of you. Have a great day, and thank you very, very much. Ruth, I'm just laughing slightly. There's Paul getting so emotional, and the dog's lying on the couch. <laughs> Not impressed at all, having a little snooze, but... Um,
um, <laughs> to be there in Conceal, raising uh, a, a glass to him today. Oh, listen, we wish we could be there with him, as, as you will remember our last Thank awards, uh, and it should be a gala Which evening. Whatever the opposite of social distancing is, it was that. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> so when that happens, believe you me, we will be doing it together with Paul, and we're just thrilled to have him as that first person to receive that really special award um, that, you know, we will hold in our hearts to keep Eileen's name alive. And of course, her legacy lives on with our terrific chief executive, Owen. Absolutely. Well, look, hopefully uh, we will be in black tie and in a ballroom somewhere celebrating next year. But until then, congratulations once again to you, Paul. So very well deserved. Let's get back to Ireland. Back to doing the things that matter, the important stuff. Back to laughing with old friends and making new ones. Back to losing track of time and back to showing how it's done. Or maybe how it's not. So sit tight, because this time we're rolling out the green carpet. And when the time comes, a hundred thousand welcomes await. Well, science and tourism don't ordinarily go hand in hand, but our next guest is no ordinary scientist, and these are extraordinary times. When the future of the pandemic in Ireland is written, our descendants might wonder why the singer of a band called Metabolics, who sold a company for almost 400 million euro when the rest of us were baking banana bread, became one of the most trusted voices of our time. Professor Luke O'Neill, you are so very, very welcome today. Um, we haven't met, and the only correspondence they had with you was a text message last night, and yep. I said, what do you not want? to talk about and I say COVID-19. Yeah. <laughs> At least you laughed, Sparrow. That was good. <laughs> I did. No, first it was terror and then it was laughter. But yeah. before we get to that, you know, you are an immunologist, a biochemist, um, and I can say without threat of the lawyers, a metabolics as well. Like, I normally couldn't say that without That's the right. COVID added. But your extraordinary journey to, like, I mean, is it not bizarre that you find yourself in a tourism conference? I suppose it is strange in a way, but I'm very happy to be here, very happy to share the knowledge. I mean, my job is partly to tell people all about science in a way, you know, and immunology, and now COVID-19, of course, has come along. So I'm very happy to take part and give information. It's a privilege in some ways to be asked to talk about these things. So I'm very happy to be here. And that's where the journey of us getting to know you, you've become a household name, I suppose, began with you um, joining Pat Kenny on his programme and such a broad range of topics, but doing, so I suppose, um, crossing that gap between are the, the tech, this was the techniques of science and then the public's understanding of it. Look, I mean, I, the amount of topics we've heard you talking about, but you see, you clearly get a bit of a thrill out of sharing that knowledge um, with us. Well, I'm a scientist first and foremost. Let's start with that. And lots of parts of science interest me. And I can bring my scientific training. I have got a PhD, you know. I want to make that yeah. clear. Yeah. It took years and years to get it. You know, so, so I can bring that scientific ability to stuff that interests me. And with Pat, we just, in the old days, <laughs> we, I just pick stuff I liked the look of, you know, and I would talk about things do, I was Do you think I was that there is a gap there? Because I, I want to speak to you just more broadly about, because um, it seems to me that science is having the best of times and the worst of times. So we've had a new change in the US administration, but some might argue, and in fact, I think you may have argued in the past that, that Donald Trump was um, anti-science yeah. to his core. And on the other side, we've got these extraordinary feats of human ingenuity, and we talk about vaccines and everything uh, in a little while. But do you think that, um, like when you look at what happened to America, it's now got back in, but it pulled out of Paris Agreement, everything. Do you think that, that long-lasting damage has been done by that anti-science agenda that came out of that administration, but was in fact in evidence everywhere. I don't think so. Science is fantastic in America. They lead the world in every aspect of science. They don't have, after the Second World War, to be honest, mm. American science ramped up massively. You know, immunology, my area, the best immunologists in the world are in, are in America. It doesn't matter who the president is. They keep doing their thing, remember. Mm. The vaccine triumph came from American companies, partly Johnson & Johnson, you know, a great example there. And in Europe as well, by the way. So. To, with that great Turkish couple. Well, exactly. Yeah. That's a German company, yeah, BioNTech. So, so whoever the president is, I mean, it was irritating mm. that they left the WHO. They backed out of the Paris Climate Accord. That was disappointing, but it didn't get reversed. You know, mm. Biden comes in, go back to normal. It's fantastic. They're back in those things, by the way. And my scientific friends in America were devastated during the Trump administration mm. because he kept saying this stuff that it was rubbish, you know. And now that he's gone, 
They're whooping for joy, let's put it that way, because now we have someone in the White House who, who is scientifically very literate, you know, and very into science, which is great. But, like, I mean, words matter, tone matters, and who says what matters. And, like, when you even think to um, jurisdictions even within Europe, like, I mean, you look to France, um, very high levels of um, resistance towards the vaccine, including by healthcare workers who are on the front line. Um, we have a small but a fairly strong anti-vax, uh, um, yep. uh, you know, uh, I suppose cohort here in Ireland. So, look, I mean, there was damage done there is. It by that. Help doesn't help mm. there, in a sense. I mean, there's always a battle there, by the way, and it's fine. It, anybody's entitled to their opinion, you see. Mm. And us scientists just get the information out as best we can. If you're reasonable, you will say vaccines work and they're very effective mm. and they're a way out of this, OK? And that's what you want. You want reasonable people, in a sense. France is a big surprise. Louis Pasteur, mm. yeah. who invented, as you know, several vaccines, and yet that's the country that's the most hesitant in Europe. It's a real mystery, isn't it? Yeah. Nobody can understand why that is. Another uh, mystery I have is want to get your views on it because... Um, you know, one of the things that really I struggle with is that some of the most strongest, most mature democracies with some of the most advanced health economies. So you look to the US, 4.25% of the world's population, over 20% of its COVID deaths. You look to the UK, which has been really our big brother, our big sister in terms of, you know, research and, and you know, and, and tuning into that, obviously, bit different post Brexit, but you look when they pass that um, landmark, 100,000 death marks. And I often wonder, will we look in the future and go, well, how did the countries that had the science, that had the knowledge, that had the networks, were, were, were how do we yeah. account for that gap? They got caught, Daryl, very simply. This is a very contagious virus. Let your guard down a tiny bit, it gets in. And all over America, they didn't follow the guidelines and the virus got in, mm. same in the UK. Other countries like Finland kept their guard up. Mm. But a tiny lack of concentration, the virus gets in. Look, in December in mm. Ireland is a good example. You know? So those countries kind of are unusual in that they took their eye off the ball a bit too much in a way, you know, and then were exploited by the virus. The virus doesn't care. You know, it'll no. spread wherever it can. So it's a strange one. But it's unusual that the UK and America, who have the mm. best scientists in the world, <laughs> the look what happened. The efficacy and the pace of vaccines, I suppose the, um, I was saying to someone last night that I was going to be interviewing you and they said, he is the vaccine. He is the antidote to all of the negative news and the bad news that we get. But you certainly have been um, an alternative and a much welcome voice in our public debate. And I wonder just, you know, sometimes do people capture the scale of the human ingenuity that has been achieved in the last year in terms yeah. of vaccines and I know we're talking about rollouts and we're you know giving out about various different things but you know and I'll talk to you later about your your clinical um research but the fact that in a year oh, yeah. people are getting jabs in their arms. Well, it's something to be very proud of if you're a scientist because it's the biggest medical achievement in 100 years, without, mm. without doubt, to go from a brand new virus, you know, mm. back in January, within nine, 11 months or whatever it was, there's now in humans, you know, the Pfizer vaccine. It was, the sun came out that day for me. I was always optimistic because I knew we'd get a vaccine. Mm. I didn't know when. I thought it might be March, April, actually, to be honest. November, we had it. It was a tremendous day, that. And then we knew this virus could be beaten with a vaccine. We didn't fully know that before that, though. It was funny, you know. But we never got a vaccine for hepatitis C or for HIV. And yeah. there was a slight worry it might take longer. But again, science was brought to bear on this and has delivered in spades. It's yeah. tremendous. And obviously, um, some of the, uh, I suppose, the, the building blocks that were needed for that um, the, you know, people went, well, how, you know, put a lot of people are sceptical going, well, how did it happen so quickly? Yeah. Money happened, collective willpower happened, leadership um, happened. I suppose it just goes to show the capacity for what happens when science does interact with other yeah. agencies to really, really create a difference. And it wasn't an, over, it wasn't an overnight success. So no. one example is the Pfizer vaccine. It took 10 years of research to make the particle that the vaccine goes into. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Before all this happened. You know? So uh, the, the good news here was there was a good 20, 25 years years of immunology already in, in the can, if you will, that could be deployed then when the virus arrived. And then we got the vaccine because of all that great background work that was done. So this is a good example of massive scientific evidence. How, how do you think that we have done, um, and I alluded to this earlier when I was um, speaking with the minister, like, I mean, the debate around zero COVID and that spectrum has become very contentious. I think it's become very unhelpful. They're probably closer than they think. Um, we're not Australia, we're not New Zealand, we're not South Korea. We've 800 years of a complex political yeah, history amongst right. um, other things to contend with. But how do you think we've been 
doing, and I did ask the Minister earlier in the context of the UK shutdown that we're now seeing, um, what could we have done differently in your view? I've got sympathy for the politicians. I hate to admit to that. It's a very tough job, this, because of all the unknowns. And they're making decisions on the who here, doing their best, mm -hmm. looking at the data in the context of Ireland, which has its own issues, you see. Yeah. So, so it's a tough one for them. That's the first thing I would say. We haven't done too bad. Look at our numbers compared to the rest of the European countries. We're pretty good. We're probably in the top third of the table, which is not bad. With the vaccination campaign yesterday, we overtook Denmark. Isn't that fantastic? Yeah. So, so it's not too bad. It could be better, of course, it could. We'd love zero COVID. Everybody would love that, wouldn't they? Well, what does that actually mean? Well, it's an awful word. I don't like it. It's yeah. just, it's very hard to achieve zero. We didn't do it with any virus other than smallpox. So didn't work a, for Diet Coke for me, so I don't know. Coke. That's right, exactly. <laughs> didn't work for that either. Uh, you want to have maybe suppression is a better word. You know, we'd love that, wouldn't we? But is we? that not a question of degree as much as kind? Like, I mean, we look with envy. You know, you look at people going to concerts and, and, and big, you know, gear in, in New Zealand, um, yeah. like us, similar population, like us, an island economy, but unlike us with the common travel area, yeah. with those things. Do, do you think, again, just as we were talking about the wealth and, and healthy, you know, or wealthy democracies, yeah. do you think that in the future historians will look back and go, it was really regrettable that the island of Ireland, both amongst themselves, but also the UK and Ireland, this didn't coordinate together you, more? You put it in the, in the too hard category, because you have to mm. coordinate with the North, and the UK and the EU. Now, can you imagine the political challenge that is huge? We're not Australia. I, I don't like the comparison with those two, for instance. Scientifically, it's unsound because <laughs> there's too many differences to say, oh, we can be like them. I mean, here's a number that struck me this morning. Uh, 310,000 people were put into hotel quarantine in Australia and New Zealand. Mm for two weeks, fully guarded. Now, could we do that here? It seems impossible to achieve that, doesn't it? Unless you massive, if, if the will well, to do it, you might, you know. Well, we have but a the will would be really difficult. You know? We have a constitution, well, so it might be well, well, that's the next even, thing, yeah. even exactly. trickier. But yeah, I, I don't know, because I, I felt that that kind of zero debate has been a little bit unhelpful, because I think people are probably much closer um, yeah. than we think on it. If you were um, Health Minister Taoiseach or Tanister for the day, or if you did have kind of a magic wand, what would you be doing right now to open up as soon as we can, see if we can. That's remarkably International easy. International travel, Go If on. I had a magic wand, mm -hmm. I'd vaccinate the entire country like that, okay? <laughs> Get the vaccine into as many arms as we can, as quickly as we can. That's the way out of this, you see. There's no question that's the way out, right? That's a scientific solution, if you will. The rest is beyond my pay grade, Daryl. That's a political <laughs> question, I don't know. I'd well, hate to be the Minister for Health or, or the Minister. I, I, I mean, we well, can advise them as best we can, you know, but it's very hard. Well, thank you for that little segue. Let's talk about your pay grade, because yeah. by the rest of us, <laughs> <laughs> Shouldn't have mentioned that, should I? The rest of us were uh, trying to engage in sea swimming and making banana bread um, with various degrees of success. Yep. Um, one of your companies sold to Roach for 380 million euro. And uh, if you read the business pages, they will say that that gave you a not insignificant uh, yep. personal fake um, news. recompense, fake news. fake news. But behind that, one, congratulations. But behind really? that is more than 30 years of trying and failing to get, uh, I know Inflamazone is one of the companies, but yeah. basically trying to, to prevent disease. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That began for me in 1985. So the thing I worked on in 85 delivered last year with that rush. The overnight deal. success. It took 35 years. I'm not joking. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a long time with many failures at a previous company that didn't work out. And, and we got there in the end and it's tremendous. And, and the, the, the money's interesting. It's not about, you know, it is about the money for the investors, obviously. Yeah. But for me, it's about the patients. Roche are the biggest drug company in the world. They took our two drugs. We have two anti-inflammatories. Mm -hmm. They will do six massive clinical trials. It'll cost them a billion euro to do these trials. Mm -hmm. They've got deep pockets because they're a very rich company. And we're talking Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, colitis, asthma. You know, fantastic. So now I'm, I'm waiting, like we're waiting with this virus to see what these trials tell us. Uh, and what, what, explain your motivation. You know, you're from Bray, I'm sure there could have been any aspects of medicine or science you could have gone into. Why, why immunology? That's a good question. When I was in Trinity, uh, in my final year, I did a project. I was doing biochemistry on Crohn's disease, that, that mm. specific disease. That got my attention. I knew there was no treatments. This mm. is in the mid-80s, very difficult disease. I began working on that disease. This is interesting. If I can do more on the immune system, that's an immune 
driven disease, I might actually make a discovery. I mean, I'm a scientist first and foremost, which means just curiosity and trying to solve problems. But if you can, can you imagine if you make a discovery that might help patients? That, that was the add on for me. I could never be an astronomer. I don't care how far that galaxy, I'm not knocking astronomy, but you know, like there's a distant star that's interestingly scientifically. But if the add on is a new medicine, it was tremendous. So I was always drawn into the, into the medical research area. And you're in quite a rarefied um, field um, now having you know, being that great honour of the Royal Society um, for you, uh, an honour not just for you personally, but for, for, for us all really to, to get into, you know, who's in there, Freud, Einstein, um, a few yeah, more. All those um, second rate people. All those second rate people. I, I believe you've taken the age category down. I have, by, by a good <laughs> 20 years, that's right. You're young yeah. and alive, I suppose that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Helps yeah. with it. But a huge honour for you and a huge, I suppose, um, recognition for, as you say, the longevity of a scientific career. Yeah, that was a big thrill, obviously, yeah. And it's a big thing in the UK. Yeah. Nobody in Ireland thinks much of it, I suppose. What do you do? Do you get any perks? Like, do you get what, what, what kind of? Well, do you want to hear a do great line? Do you get the greatest sheep or anything? You know the way you've, I'm sure you've loads of letters after your name, have you? Like me, you know, loads of letters after our name. If you get the FRS, the president said to me, take the rest away, just FRS. That's all you do, because, you know, that, that trumps everything else. That was quite nice. You know, the Excellent. FRS. And another, another one, I, on the day I was inducted, you got a special ceremony in London and you signed the book. The first signature is Isaac Newton. So your hand is shaking. It's this thick, the book, by the way. And you're allowed to look at one other signature. You can pick any name you like. Everybody wants to see Freud or Einstein. Mm. I looked up Edward Conway. We're in UCD. The previous biologist before me was Edward Conway in 1953. Wow. So, so show me, no one looked up his name. Great. Show me Conway's name. You know, I think I see he signed it. You know, that was a real thrill to sign the book. And can I talk to you just about motivation? One of the category of scientists that I'm obsessed with, um, I'm always kind of watching the, the documentaries, is the virus hunters. So those scientists who are out like in bat caves and in places like, you know, we've called this the China virus. It could have easily been Vietnam. It yep. could have easily been anywhere else. And interest in the World Health Organization from its limited exploration in Wuhan is now saying more definitively that it jumped, you know, from an animal. But that is a real kind of very, yep. and that connects obviously back into immunology in a, in a huge way. Well, we've got a very famous person in the new city, Emma Teeling. She mm -hmm. is a world expert on bats. And she came back from the US. She's got her lab here in, in UCD. She's one of the, the virus hunters in bats. And they're a very important group of people. Now, before this coronavirus eruption, she had trouble getting grant money, for instance. You know, she did OK. But now the spotlight is on the bat, absolutely. Because bats, bats harbour thousands of coronaviruses. So, of course, we don't want to happen again, do we? The, the, big, the big mission now is to stop this reoccurring. Do you think there's a fear that this, in fact, this horrendous thing we're going through could actually be the one before the one, that this could be a, a sort of a, a warning that because of that, like, that de I'm looking at the, that lovely kind of picture of the, the greenery, but that deforestation, the way yeah. that we are living, that proximity of humans, whether it's civets or bats or whatever it yeah. is. Um, you know, are, are we going to see more and more of these incidences in the future and will science be able to keep up with That's it? That's the concern. It's a bit mm -hmm. random. I mean, it's bad luck as well with this one, for instance. This is a very malicious virus, by the way. I can't see it getting much worse than this in a way, you know, because it is and, and it, was it was really brought home. I'm sure many people who are listening to us, um, Luke, would have watched RT Investigates yeah, last I saw that night, myself. Which, you know, that really brings it home, doesn't it? Yeah, people really, forget how serious this is, actually, until you see those images, then you go, good God, this, yeah, this is something and, that's... Uh, and, and another part of science and medicine working, like just this, the amount of people involved just yeah. for one, you know, intensive care bed. And I just Huge. thought, God, if anybody doubted the severity of yeah. this. I know, and they were doubting it for a long time. I, I get lots of uh, haters from time to time. Back mm. in March, April, oh, you're, you're a doom and gloom guy. And even though I'm positive, if you say a single negative thing about it, they come at you and go, that can't be true. This is all fake. It's all that sort of stuff. And look at that documentary last night. That really brings home how serious this is. Yeah. Now, the good news there is they're getting better at therapies in hospitals. Yeah. The death rate's halved just with treatments, even without the vaccine. Mm. So we're making progress every day with this virus, which is extremely important to remember. Yeah, but I suppose that there is also, you know, which comes, you know, it's, it's science is always chasing yep, you yep. know that and one of the things that and it speaks to I know sort of teasing you about the fact that you're a multi multi-millionaire and <laughs> fair play to you but one of the things is that um, it is the funding yeah. and for research well, like the, the cost and especially now like I mean we're in a low rate interest environment we've been able to kind of to put on in all these supports because we're not under perhaps as much. Yeah. It's slightly different from the previous crisis but at the same time making the case for that investment yeah in science because, as you say, look, I mean, e even your own work is going to require, what, an extra billion to, 
yeah. to put it into trial? Well, it's very simple in a way. And, and thankfully, Ireland, beginning in 2000, began to invest in science. Science Foundation Ireland did a great job. My lab was funded by SFI. That's the taxpayer. We make our discovery. We form mm -hmm. a company. One of the investors in our company was the Irish taxpayer through the Strategic Investment Fund. Mm -hmm. They got a big return. Now, the money, the headline amount, by the way, I want to be clear. I get a tiny bit of that because there's, 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 there's four investors, one of whom was ISAF. And yeah. so it's a virtuous circle, isn't it? So funding and research will always pay back in the long run. It might take time, you know, but it's a bit but tricky. Do you think some governments are afraid, well, well I mean, it's okay because that worked out, but other things won't? Do you think there is that fear? And to what extent do you think uh, Brexit will alter the, that landscape? Because um, the, the, I mean, the UK, great research, but yeah. did very, very well out of the various um, EU programmes. Um, will we get a, a benefit from that or will we be losing out that our sort of big brother or sister in Europe is, is no longer strictly part of the scene? No, they'll still get access to that, I bet you. They won't be denied access <laughs> to the European Research Council because mm. they're a European country still, remember. Yeah. They're not in the EU, but they are part of Europe. And as you said, Derville, some of the best science in the world right. goes on in the UK. You know, and we're, I have loads of collaborators there. I did my own PhD in England, you know, in London. So that connection won't go, I bet you. Yeah. It'll continue. Can I talk to you about, um, you know, uh, some people might say you're a maverick and, and I think mavericks are really, really important and you know the the big thing that we've seen very heavily thankfully very heavily promoted particularly for young women is the promotion of stem and now we're seeing the big a come back into stem for steam yep. which is the arts and that importance of um, the arts i discovered that we've one thing in common we've both played <laughs> at the trinity ball yeah but i, I managed to bring together. my instrument home with me Derby, unlike you you left your violin <laughs> i did leave a violin behind yes, that was <laughs> it was in a safe place i just couldn't find it um but that importance of um or that synergy between the arts and science is actually really 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 um important and supporting people to go off and have those maverick ideas yep. um like as you say even just the the um the, the whole solution that came forward in the vaccines was 10 years in the making yep. by uh, a, a couple who had emigrated actually from turkey who had gone That's to right. germany yep. and yep. you know had done extraordinary work so how important is it to have those kind of maverick thinkers because you talk about it in your book the risk takers versus yep. It's extremely important. And in fact, to be a good scientist, you have to be creative. It means mm. having ideas, trying something new, a bit different. And the arts are always pushing the boundary, aren't they? Mm. And science, the overlap is amazing. People think they're two separate things, but they're not. And many scientists are actually musicians or mm. artists as well. An artist could be that. Uh, what keeps them in is the dreaded terminology. That's the only thing that's tricky about science, you know, mm. is these awful new language and that puts people off, you know. But the interface is so important, in fact. You know? And talking about, you know, how important music is to you, because I know like you'd be playing a docky and various different gigs. Are, are you missing getting out and, and playing with the guys? I am. It's, it's, it's tough. And t two of the guys in the Metabolics are professional musicians out of work for a year. It's devastating for them, you know. So I, I, mm -hmm. I managed to go on telly on Monday night to go on a bubble, right? <laughs> And someone said, oh, you looked a bit strange. That's to give to musicians. Let's bring, somehow bring gigs back. You know, if you can do a gig with 300 people in bubbles, it's better yeah. than nothing, isn't it? This kind of yeah. thing. So, so I felt very, it's tough for them. Like, like many people are finding yeah. it tough. And, 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 and we're all missing these things, aren't we? So. I know, yeah, no, I am. I'm missing playing. I'm, I'm missing going to gigs. I'm missing, yeah, exactly. uh, you know, kind of seeing people. And how, how soon do you think we will be able to, you know, to do that? Like, I mean, I know they're saying kind of maybe in March, we might be able to meet our family and friends outside yeah you know um that th it's the, that's it's the, hard it's the big unknown sadly isn't it and we just yeah. we just don't know i mean there's a couple of concerns we have these new variants are in our minds mm. a bit now and now again we've got ways to handle them but this thing this damn virus you know we still don't know enough about it really now i can i can imagine one, once the vaccination campaign is fully blazing and we're getting mm. lots of people protected. The death rate begins to fall hugely. Hospitalizations fall hugely. And that should be sustained for months, right? Governments have to open up from that moment on. Now, the question is, how do you do it? Do you do it carefully? Do you do certain things first? Outdoors is great, remember? There's a 19-fold decreased risk just by going outdoors, you see. So outdoor venues should begin to come back. They might contain the numbers. You might allow 100 people, 200, 300, those kinds of numbers. My, my big prediction was the beer garden in June. I'm yeah. still looking forward to that. That, that was a setup, by the way. Jennifer, was <laughs> well, she, no, she said to me, um, Luke, uh, when will beer gardens reopen? I said June. The next morning, O'Neill says beer yeah. gardens reopen. So, so I was caught with that. But, um, but it's outdoors. But, it, but isn't know. it interesting that even perhaps even something you say in jest 
Well, this is what happens. Because yeah, 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 yeah. I mind you, I did, I did mean it. I mean, it's outdoors. Yep. The tables could be distanced. We need creative. It's in our, it's in our power, and, and the tourism business particularly, of course, it's in our power to bring things back mm. safely, just for a while. There's a six-month period now ahead of us, and we have to be careful, let's face it. You know? The big thing we've got to watch for is coming to October and making sure the viral count is massively low, making sure 80% of our people are vaccinated. The winter then, we needn't fear it, you know? Mm. And then the big question becomes opening travel again. That, the two big metrics to me, David, are very simple. When will we go to a football match? Thousands of people, and when can we travel? They're the two questions that will, will be and the key And what do you think could, do we need to do? Like, I mean, in some, in some, there are very immediate questions around, is it PCR, is it antigen testing? Mm. If we can let truckers come in um, over, why can't we let tourists come in yeah. and there is, you know, all, all of that debate. Like, I mean, for you, and obviously there's difference in costing regimes yeah. and everything, but again, what do you think if we were to try and kind of safely reopen travel, what would be the, the, the things that we need to put in place? It's all about de-risking, let's face it. What can you do to de-risk? And, and antigen testing is one way to de-risk. If you take that test, it's a rapid test. It mightn't be perfect, mm -hmm. but it will give you an indication that can be very powerful, you know, a bit like, and if the hauliers are doing it, what I keep saying is this, they, they've approved it for the, the, the truck driver. Why not everybody else, yeah. you know? Including schools, by the way. But can you imagine the airports? Well, do you think we should be doing test? that in schools then? Do you think that, um, and that there's cost implications, but, you know, do you think um, that we should be doing antigen testing in schools? Look, I mean, look, I mean, the countries, and I know you're saying there's no comparison to South Korea or to Australia or to New Zealand, but what they have got very well is it's not just the airports, the quarantine, they track and trace yep. and they're following it. And I, I don't think we're there yet in terms of that level of chasing... Well, this virus. If I was the Minister for Health, mm -hmm. I would increase the number of public doctors tenfold. Okay, that's the first thing, because they're in every community, they're watching out for the virus, they're putting the fire out quickly. That's the job of public mm -hmm. health, is to put the fire out as soon as you can. And we've got enough of them, that's the first thing, right? Secondly, antigen testing in schools would be a brilliant thing, because the teachers are less fearful, because they're frightened as well, remember. Mm -hmm. You can spot an infection immediately and then put the fire out quickly. So it's a huge weapon to use. It just takes the will to do it. It will involve an investment. It's, mm -hmm. not, it's not as expensive as other things, by the way. Way, let's face it. Yeah. So I, I'd be bringing in more antigen testing for, as a weapon against this virus. Yeah, just to really, really chase and, it And down. that will pick up any variant, remember. So if we're worried about variants coming in, the way to track them is through antigen testing. You Do you know um, when we, because we always make comparisons with, you know, previous pandemics and they change the course of history. They change labour markets, they change economies, they change everything. But, you know, I remember when people saying, oh, but the 1918 flu, it lasted three years. And here we are, in year two, and I wonder for all of the advances, yeah. why, because it's conceivable, because it's conceivable that we will move from a pandemic, as you, as you say, it could be into an epidemic. Yeah, it could be, that's right. Yeah, um, yeah. We're, we're, I think we could be on the cusp of that, but um, do you kind of feel that there's a lot of advances and yet at the same point, are, are we any different from our... And we are massively because of the vaccine, obviously. Yeah. They, they could, they, you know, back, back when the 1918 flu, viruses had not been discovered. Okay, that, mm. that's, how, that's how long ago it was. So we've got great science now, haven't we? And I had a, had a great call yesterday with Moderna, who are one of the big mm. companies. They gave me such positivity. We've turned a huge corner against this virus now because of these vaccines. And now it's just a question of getting them rolled out. You know, and, and as long as we do that... And getting them rolled out is not just a question for for Ireland, like, I mean, the real concern is that no one is safe until everyone yeah. is safe. How do we get these vaccines to the countries that need them most, yeah. you know, because we're, we're very Western centric, we're very, you know, um, North American, kind of European centric, yeah. and you look to other jurisdictions where they don't even have ventilator capacity, yeah. let alone this. So but how are we going to, you know, democratise that and make sure that the vaccines because they're costly things to... That, that's mission one. That's part of mission one, because obviously we've got to get the vaccine all over the world. Now, remember, AstraZeneca are making hundreds of millions of doses available to developing countries. They mm -hmm. said that at the start, you know, and we're going to see a massive ramp up now in vaccination campaigns in the developing world as well. That may take a bit longer. It's more difficult, you know, logistically, I guess, but that's got to be part of the future, because if we don't do that, there's a risk of it coming back in from those countries. Secondly, new variants might begin mm -hmm. in those countries that are more mischievous. So it's in all our interests to push that button as well and say, look, let's get the vaccine as widespread and as global as we can. What is, in your view, and I've, I haven't even got a chance to talk to you about your view, Humanology, it was absolutely fantastic and I absolutely loved it, but what, in your view, is the greatest scientific advancement in humanity and what is the one discovery you wish you had made? Right. 
Let me think mm. about that for a minute. <laughs> well, the biggest advance in science, without doubt, was the discovery of DNA, because it explains how living systems operate. And that was in the 1950s. Watson, Crick, Rosalind mm. Franklin, Morris Wilkins, they're the four names. They discovered the DNA double helix, and that explains life. You know, without that, there'd be no vaccines, there'd be no genes, there'd be no molecular biology. My research couldn't work without that discovery. Mm. So everything pivots around the wonderment of DNA. So I'd love to have made that discovery yeah. myself, made in Cambridge where, where I trained, you know, partly. So that was good. Of all the discoveries in history, um, uh, the one I'd like to have made most of all would have been the discovery of a vaccine. <laughs> <laughs> Probably smallpox. We forget this one, yeah. you see. That was a devastating disease. One in three died of that. Can you imagine a virus that killed one in three people? Uh, one in three were marked for life and one in three got mm. over it. Jenner, and Lady Mary Workley Montague, another uh, person who gets forgotten, by the way, she and Jenner get the credit for that, really. And then that stops this awful disease, you see. Yeah. So that would be a great thing to have discovered. If you were to, you know, they sometimes say, if you were to put something in a, a time capsule from this period of time and maybe somebody in 50 or 100 years would open it, um, what would you bring with you from this period that we have been through, either on a personal or a yeah. professional or even on a societal level as you know we, we looked earlier at a, a bit of tape from when the then uh, Taoiseach uh, Leo Varadkar made that seminal speech about how our children's children would be yeah. remembering this what do you think you will bring with you from this time if we were to give a signal to the future I'd generations? I'd bring a hundred copies and never mind the bollocks here's the science <laughs> so I could sell it into the future now, um, what would I bring with that's a tough question to answer what uh, would I bring with me from these times yeah um, I guess I, I would bring that Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. I'll tell you why, because it's new technology. That was an RNA vaccine, never ever devised, never approved in humans, 95% efficacy. Now, what that means is we can use that technology for any infectious disease, remember. Mm. Now, my, in my world, we will beat COVID, no doubt about it. What we're learning with COVID, we can apply to malaria, HIV, cancer. The, the German couple who, who built yeah. BioNTech, they were going after cancer initially, a vaccine yeah. for cancer. So can you imagine if, if this technology turns into treatments for, yeah. or ways to prevent cancer, wouldn't that be superb? I, I hope actually that couple get their deserved, deserved uh, indeed, place they in history. Yeah, exactly. uh, the story of two yeah. Turkish immigrants yep. who, who then went to Germany and, and got it. But listen, look, I could speak to you for an entire hour. I thank you. It, it, I really do thank you for your, your generosity and for making uh, it all so um, explicable to us. And we might get a, a chance to uh, jam in the future. Hopefully. At, some time. at the Trinity Ball. At the Trinity Whenever Ball. Whenever the three run. I'll, I'll remember to bring it with me. Exactly. But listen, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, we really, really do appreciate it. And listen, um, I hope you enjoy that as much as I do. Stay with us because we now have a stellar industry panel to share their views on what happens next. But first, this. Let today be a good day. Let me give it my all. Let the shutters up and the customers in. Let me learn to let go, to trust. Let me know when to pull back and when to push on. Let the staff know they're valued. I couldn't do it without them. Let the kids know I'll be home for bedtime. Right. Let's take that risk. Let's really go for it now. Let's be proud of what we've done. Okay, let's get to work. It takes a certain kind of brave to run a business. We see it, we back it. Well, it has been a year like no other. But what does recovery look like in two, five, even 10 years time? I'm joined in studio by Tourism Ireland Chief Executive Niall Gibbons and by Paul Kelly, CEO of Fulcher Ireland. 
We are also joined online by Neve O'Shea, General Manager of the Clarny Park Hotel, by Mark Crothill, CEO of the Scottish Tourism Alliance, and by Cathy Bryce, who's the Managing Director of Corporate, Institutional and Business Banking at AIB. And you're all very, very welcome. Mark, Cathy and Neve. I'll get to you shortly, but I first want to go in studio to... Um, uh, to Paul Kelly. I won't ask you what you'll put in your time capsule for the next <laughs> 50 years, Paul, but you just recently had your own very successful conference and um, you spoke very strongly and bullishly about the recovery. You talked about 9-11, the financial crisis, all of these other issues that we bounced back from. But you paused and hesitated when it came to this crisis. And I'm just wondering what is so different about this that distinguishes it from all those previous crises that we have come through? I think it's, it's, it's the scale and speed of the crisis. Uh, I mean, the, way I'd put, the way I put it is that the, the level of decline in the tourism revenue of the Irish economy is, is four times what it was during the financial crisis within this crisis. And, and that financial crisis, that four times revenue decline took four years to happen. And this time it happened overnight. Uh, on whatever it was, the 12th of March or the 11th of March last year, um, uh, it, just, it just turned off. So a much bigger, much deeper crisis, much faster. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, in terms of, I think that, you know, and it's, and it's also a crisis that, you know, tourism, because of the nature of the, you know, what spreads the virus is people traveling and people socializing, and that's fundamentally what tourism is about. It means that, you know, in terms of the, the, the pace of the recovery of tourism, you know, is being slowed by the public health considerations. Uh, so, you know, in terms of, so it, we, we will come back absolutely, but obviously we were all hoping we'd be, you know, further along that recovery than we are right now. And I think um, the, the expectations for, for the first quarter have been, it's, it really has changed and it's just yeah. so dynamic and fluid moving. Niall, um, you, I suppose, came into this role just shortly after 9-11, which at the time would have been seen as kind of the worst thing to affect the aviation and the international tour of business at that time. Um, how have you been managing all of this or, or how is it, you know, how different is it for you you know, because you're out fighting for Ireland on the international stage. Yeah, I think the difference this time is that, you know, foot and mouth 9-11 happened back in uh, 2001, and uh, they impacted largely on the North American market. I mean, the British market actually grew the following year. So what you're seeing was impacts on individual source markets, but not the whole globe. I mean, now we're looking at a point where in a normal pre-COVID year, 1.4 billion people would take trips around the globe, spending one and a half trillion US dollars. So there's now 350 million people who work in hospitality with their livelihoods on the line with no immediate um, site of international recovery right now. I think that's what's upsetting and impacting on everybody. So any time in the past where we had the global financial crisis, where we had things like SARS, I remember being on the contingency committee in relation to that, terrorist incidents around the world in London, Madrid, Bali, they all have an immediate impact on long haul travel or one particular market, but you could always turn to another market, direct your focus, you know, to Britain, to America, Europe, whatever, to try and save the season, so to speak. But literally now we're, we're in a much different situation. Take them all and multiply them by 20, you're not even near, anywhere near it. And the minister referenced it earlier when I spoke to her, um, the research that you've been undertaking in terms of trying to look beyond what is it that the consumer and, you know, especially in those key source markets, what they want. Can you tell us just a little bit about that, both in terms of what do consumers want, but perhaps I think we have to be mindful as well. What are they afraid of? Yeah, look, we've done six waves of research in our top four markets. and We've done a couple of deep dives into our top 11 markets. Now, there's three big things the consumer is telling us. First of all, is they're dying to get back to travel again, by the way, and that's very heartening. They will travel again. Uh, but what they're saying is that they'll travel to destinations near home. Uh, they want to get back to seeing their friends and family and they want to get back to going to places that are familiar. And what that means for Ireland, it's good news actually, it means that there are closer to home source markets like Great Britain, mainland Europe, and also North America will be well poised for recovery when the time comes. What they're also telling us is that in, they're nervous about travel and they do not want to catch this virus, they do not want to bring it home, and above all, they do not want to end up getting quarantined. Yeah, and obviously that's a big, big issue. We were discussing it earlier, obviously with the UK, very uh, big headlines there um, the, this morning. Um, but Paul, just, you know, the figures, we, we sort of trot them out, but behind it are, it's quite scary, the, that 160,000 job losses before you get to that multiplier effect of all of the, the companies that support uh, the tourism industry. 
Yeah, it, look, it's, it's uh, and, and you know, in terms of it, when you talk in those kind of numbers, it feels very abstract, you know, but behind every single one of those numbers, there's, there's an individual, there's a family, there's, there's a small business. And, 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 and you know, what's, 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 what's so, I suppose, you know, disheartening uh, and so important that we, that, that we recover from is because there are so many businesses in, in, in tourism in Ireland that are, that are family run, small businesses that, uh, you know, in terms of that, that the, the business isn't just the job, it's the life savings, it's the pension, it's, it's everything for that family. Uh, and, and that's why it's so important that, you know, in terms of the supports are there to help people survive through, uh, through this crisis and then that the recovery comes as, as quickly as possible. I, I want to see just on that, Paul, we might bring in um, Neve, uh, if you can hear me okay. I just wanted to just to pick that piece up about the jobs and supports because we know that obviously coronavirus has severely impacted the sector and lots of different regions in the country, but some 45% of people, almost one in two people in Kerry where you are, are receiving some sort of support, whether that's the pandemic unemployment support or Job Seekers Alliance. And whatever way you put that, that is a scary, scary figure. Thanks, Turbal. Um, yes, it is. Uh, the, the pause on tourism has had a wrenching effect on communities across Kerry. We have the highest dependency on tourism income per capita in the country. To give you an idea of the figures behind that 45%, there are over 14,000 direct employees in tourism in Kerry. Well, if reliance on tourism extends way beyond that figure when you factor in retail and the multiples of small businesses that are an integral part of our overall offering. We have gone in Kerry from an estimated 2.6 million visitors in 2019 to a trickle and in monetary terms a predicted loss for 2020 in the region of 1 billion euro. Occupancy at our two hotels, the Killarney Park and the Ross, has tumbled um, Paul has touched on it there and uh, we employ 150 people across the two hotels. So that's like 150 families that are impacted. Uh, traditionally, hotel occupancy would be in the region of about 75% for us for a full year. Um, and last year, we just about made it over 20%, which is pretty much the average for hotels across the county of Kerry. Thankfully, though, um, you know, self-catering, carbons and camping did fare much better. Um, and But it does have to be said that across Kerry, uh, and I'm sure the whole country, that there is great appreciation for the range of government supports that have been put in place. Absolutely. And that might be a good point to bring you in, uh, Cathy Bryce, because, you know, um, earlier on, Ruth Andrews was acknowledging the huge supports that the government has uh, provided to, to the economy in general but also to this sector in particular. And I was just wondering, you know, what you're seeing on the ground and how are initiatives like the, uh, the credit guarantee scheme helping the sector at the moment, Cathy? Yeah, thanks, Erwin. I mean, uh, first of all, we do have to acknowledge the, the significant government support in terms of wage and grants. And that has been at the core of trying to keep uh, companies uh, uh, ticking over um, through this. But um, things like the credit guarantee scheme are also very important. Uh, obviously, um, they, they're promoted by the government and being distributed by ourselves and the other banks. Um, the take up in the initial months uh, from September onwards was, was relatively low, but um, we're seeing increased take up now from January. Um, and uh, that's, that has been extended, the availability until June. And really, you know, we'd encourage companies to, to, to look to see whether that's uh, you know, whether that's a solution for them. Um, I think beyond that, you know, you've got larger uh, entities like Delata, who are public companies. They've been able to access uh, equity capital markets to really bolster their liquidity. Um, obviously, the smaller companies aren't, aren't as fortunate. Um, and uh, it's really, but it's, it, you know, I, I think I would be encouraging companies to really trying to, to look forward in terms of managing their liquidity, because while government supports have been hugely helpful, during the, the, the full lockdown, really the hard part is, is, is as the economy reopens and as trade gradually, you know, hopefully comes back, uh, that companies have sufficient liquidity and funds to, 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 to uh, work through it all. And I just want to bring that back to studio, um, Niall, just the point Cathy was making there. Like, I mean, it's, it's fine for public listed companies in a way. They can go out to the markets, they can draw down equity. There's 20,000 
businesses in Ireland that won't have that. Do you worry that even with the supports, even with commitments that, you know, by the government that there won't be any cliff edges, that accessing equity for a lot of tourism businesses, but for SMEs, could be a crunch point? It's extremely hard when your cash flow has been, you know, reduced by five billion internationally last year. And obviously, you know, the fortunes of this year will depend on whether and when things get to restart. Um, however, what we have tried to do in Tourism Ireland is try and utilise the, the capacity we have within our control. And since the latter part of 2020 and into this year, we've been offering all our international platforms free to industry. So that's eased the cash flow somehow. It's made sure that we haven't lost connectivity with the market. It's ensured that the lights have remained on for Ireland abroad. And there's actually been over 10,000 opportunities between overseas buyers and industry suppliers here that have been happening in association with our colleagues here in Forge Ireland as well. Never been more joined up and those uh, opportunities will continue as long as we're in lockdown. Paul, when you look across the, um, the recovery, you know, um, and even in what has been a really, really difficult year, there are sections of this economy that are not just doing well, but are flying it, you know, and um, when you think of the tourism sector, it might, as we said earlier, it might be as big as some of the, the services in terms of revenue, but it's all about the jobs, isn't it? Isn't that really where the, the, the impact is? Yeah, when you, when you look at, uh, I'll just come to that in a moment if I can, but just, just I suppose to say that, you know, those points about, you know, the cash flow and, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and managing that, there, just to, to a slight add, there is a huge range of supports available on fallsireland.ie for any businesses that are, that are looking at that. We've got a range of kind of financial mentoring uh, programs and workshops and clinics. So I'd encourage any, anyone to, in, everyone to engage in that. Uh, and, uh, and see the kind of supports and help we can give in terms of helping businesses work, work with banks like AIB and others uh, mm -hmm. in terms of to, to, to do that. Come, come back to your point, Derville, around the, uh, the jobs. Yeah, I mean, that's, if, if you look at macro, you know, in terms of the, the, the contribution of tourism to Ireland, you know, uh, you know, we, we do, we contribute, the, the sector back in 2019 contributed about 1.7 to 1.8 billion in exchequer revenue, which is big, but not as big as some of the other sectors. When you look at kind of the, the overall impact on GDP, you know, we're, to some of you can see that it's actually not probably down as much as we might have thought it had been. But what tourism does isn't so much about exchequer revenue and GDP as tourism gives jobs like no other sector. It employs, it employs people, it employs people in parts of the country where other sectors can't really reach to. Um, uh, so so that's, the, that's the really important thing. And I think, you know, some of the points that Neve was making as well is that what I, th what I think people are, are, are getting a pre an appreciation of that they never had before was how important that tourism business is back into the economy up the supply chain, up into the people who supply the food to restaurants and hotels, up to people who supply the, the, the laundry and linen services, the, 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 the catering services, the you know, beds, all everything. of those things, yeah. you know, people are, are probably hadn't a full appreciation of how important all of the, that visitor revenue was in terms of how it feeds so much of the economy. Let's cross over to Scotland because, um, uh, Mark Ruddell, timing is everything. And there you were last March out with your shiny vision to 2030 and then a bit like us, it all went. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Derville. But first of all, thank you very much for the invitation to be part of today. I mean, you're, you're very good friends over there and we only wish we could be with you. Uh, enjoying some of the black stuff and uh, may I offer my congratulations to Paul as well. Um, but you're right, uh, March the uh, 3rd last year, um, we'd spent 18 months bringing together Scotland's future tourism strategy, Scotland Outlook 2030. Uh, we had our national conference with a thousand delegates in Glasgow, the first minister on the stage and launched the strategy. And it was on the same day that Scotland had its first hospitalized case of COVID in Dundee. So uh, um, I seem to remember telling the, those in the audience to uh, wash their hands very well, singing happy birthday twice, because that was the uh, instructions from the prime minister. But never did we believe that we would be in the situation we're in right now. And so we literally lurched from a, a launch of a future vision and Owen's uh, opening remarks around uh, how you guys had fared over there in 2019 was very, very similar to ourselves. Strong year, very confident about what lies ahead. Um, and now, of course, we're in a, a very, very difficult and extremely challenging situation and effectively closed. 
Um, so um, we've been in crisis mode ever since. Uh, and again, much of what's been said uh, by uh, contributors this morning um, in Scotland, we've mirrored that, um, but we are slightly different in the sense that tourism is devolved and we have both um, Westminster and Scottish governments um, to rely on and help and work with uh, to see us through uh, the path uh, now, you, the other think, end. Do you think that that, uh, Mark, has really helped that devolved function and also I mean, the fact that the UK is a standalone tourism minister? I know you sit on the um, UK Tourism Council, but it seems from this side of uh, the IRC that you've really been able to, um, you've been quite successful in terms of really shaping policy, direct engagement right up to and including with Nicola Sturgeon and with other key people um, in London. But has that been a, a, a positive part of the experience dealing with the, the politics? Absolutely. I mean, right from the outset, we've uh, had a very, very strong and good relationship with the government ministers. And in fact, the strategy was built in a collaborative way yeah. with Visit Scotland, the government and the industry very much at its heart. So um, from literally uh, week one of, of the crisis, uh, we convened our industry council, which is made up of all the sector groups. The cabinet secretary, Fergus Ewing, attended every week uh, and we were able to bring together what was the, uh, the recognised or the urgent needs for support and help then shape and influence packages of support beyond that. And the First Minister has been available to us as well on a regular basis for calls, as has the Finance Secretary. We've just had the Scottish budget. But uh, the UK Tourism Industry Council is very much a mirror image of our own. Uh, and having Nigel Huddleston uh, co-chair that with Simon Vincent, um, you know, the same issues that we're all facing in the sector. It doesn't matter which country you're in, um, as was Paul was said, you know, we're such a vital part of the economy. Um, and I think increasingly so more recognised by others, um, we, we want the same thing. So VAT at 5% has been a big call from our sector. And uh, thankfully that has been put in place. Um, business rates. But the consequentials that come through from the Chancellor's announcements ultimately will drive the uh, the additional support that's needed in to the sector in Scotland that then can be distributed accordingly. So the relationship has been you know, absolutely uh, essential and it continues to be so. And uh, we're very grateful for that. And I think without it, we'd be in a much worse situation. And I think that there's, if, if we were in a live conference setting, Paul, there'd be a collective gasp at that 5%. But um, I want to pick up on a note uh, there, Niall, um, just speaking to, you know, the politics of pandemics and the fact that Scotland is devolved. And the refrain, and I've used it myself, was, but look at foot and mouth. Look what we did across the island when foot and mouth <laughs> happened. And sure, if we could do it for animal health, why haven't we been able to do it for uh, human health? As the chief executive of an all-island body, What's tricky about doing stuff like that? What's different? Is um, it because the politics is different? Well, I think back at the foot and mouth uh, episode, you, you had uh, two ministers that were very keen to work together uh, from theme. the same tradition and uh, animals don't have votes, maybe is another factor, but that's a uh, tongue in cheek, I, I, sh I should say. I think, look, the bottom line is that we have had over the last 19 years, 19 business plans agreed by ministers in both jurisdictions uh, on how we promote the island of Ireland. Well, there's, there's different views all around the island of Ireland as to how we should be promoted. But by and large, when we thrash all the issues out, people come together on it. But we've never seen a situation like we're in now. I mean, and, you know, the supports that have been given by government, both on the fiscal side in terms of wage supports, VAT reductions in Northern Ireland for 5%, down here 9%, I mean, have, have been unheard of, you know. So, so there has been a huge level of awareness of the scale and size of the challenges facing the industry. Um, and I think the question now for us, and we've been asking it over the last year, is how can we be ready for recovery? And it is for us in tourism Ireland, you know, talking to our industry all the time, listening to our consumer abroad, connectivity is going to be absolutely vital because we know the pent up demand will be there, but getting here then will be the challenge. But supporting our business along with our colleagues in Forge Ireland through the crisis so they come out in shape on the other side. Yeah, and just, uh, just to bring you back, back in on that, Mark, um, you know, we're very close, we're Celtic cousins and all the rest, but actually when we speak to the issue of uh, connectivity that Niall has just raged, actually Scotland and Ireland are very, very different markets insofar as there is a greater dependence on the international market in Ireland. It seems to be a bit more of a dynamic mix in Scotland. Yeah, I mean, our, our mix of, uh, of trade has been 70% domestic and 30% international, but you can't underestimate the importance of the international spend. And the market is three and a half million uh, visitors we had from international shores. And, you know, effectively, when you look at golf tourism, something very close to your heart, you know, that's 90% international dependent. Uh, our inbound our international conferencing agenda, two, two billion roughly in value. Um, you know, these are all huge, huge uh, 
markets that are reliant on that international movement and not forgetting the tour guides and the operators and of course you know um, the Edinburgh festivals and uh, all the many uh, other festivals that we do in big events so uh, I think um, there's some you know, some analysis that's done it, it would take about eight million an increase of eight million domestic visits to replace the the international revenue but we do have a domestic audience to go after uh, and it's important that you know we we present a, a clear invitation and actually uh, allow as many people as possible to explore Scotland and get out and about and you know support the recovery of the sector as a whole but pent-up demand is there for people thankfully to come back to Scotland where we, the inbound tour operator community tells us that so uh, we just want to be you know ready and able to open up again but the day today's uh, or yesterday and today's announcements of quarantine hotels and uh, obviously puts another barrier I suppose in the way and maybe causes further concern or, or reservations as about when that uh, traveller may have a chance to uh, to visit again in, in, in the near future. Just to stay with the domestic market, uh, Neve, I want to just go back to you because, uh, you know, when it comes to the difference between what happened uh, between, I suppose, the urban areas and the rural, you know, some might be tempted to say, well, look, we know what you did last summer. You had half, uh, you had at least of all the rest of the regions, the rural areas kind of, or the coastal areas seem to have had a better uh, deal than, than the city centre ones. But um, did you get, a, you know, a good boost or something positive from that short season last year? And what do you think we need to be doing now in your view to get ready for that recovery, that pent up demand that Mark and others have spoken about? Uh, yes, uh, Durbel. Um, yes, uh, Kerry um, is a, an attractive destination for our holiday makers um, and we did do well um, last summer. We're very grateful for um, our customers and rest assured like last year, we will build on our safe destination badge and there'll be no shortage of things to do for families in our beautiful outdoors. Uh, but let's not forget though, that until international travel resumes, um, we won't see a, a full recovery. Um, but what would we like um, to see happen now? Um, I think government needs to put um, tourism centre stage and help help us to get back on track um, as quickly as possible. Um, Niall has mentioned there our tourism agencies have done a super job on consumer research, uh, both at home and on in the international marketplace. So we have the knowledge. Um, we just now need to take action, and we need to invest and do it quickly. Uh, outdoors, like um, activities like walking, hiking, biking, have become increasingly popular during the COVID period. Um, and the same can be said for food experiences. Uh, so we have the natural landscape. Uh, we now just need to fast track any shovel ready projects that are already sitting in any urban renewal schemes, uh, visitor experience development plans and any other infrastructural development plans such as greenways, cycleways, mountain and food trails. Um, and I also think that we have to work um, as a concerted industry. Um, I, you know, as, as part of the success we had last year was is because is down to the fact that at a county level, you know, we bandied under um, Kerry uh, Tourism Industry um, Forum, um, and you know, on a national level, then obviously under ITIC um, and the Hotel Federation. Thanks a million, Eve. And that, Cathy, it might be just, uh, I know in, in your day job, you're looking right across um, the economy, you know, in terms of business banking, but, you know, and there must be some sectors which m might even be in a more precarious position even than, than tourism in terms of its capacity to bounce back. And I'm thinking particularly of retail, anyone who kind of walks through some of our city streets, it's, it, it's, it's fairly difficult to do that at the moment and see the scale of the devastation. But how innovative do you think this sector is and, and do you think that institutions like um, AIB are going to want to back uh, a sector that's on its knees at the moment, but would have good capacity for recovery when, when hopefully all those therapies and vaccines come through? Yeah, so a couple of things there. Thanks, Daryl. Um, I mean, first of all, uh, the, the tourism sector may be only equaled by, by retail um, in its impact uh, across our domestic portfolio. So um, undoubtedly, it's just been such a huge shock as, as Niall and Paul has referred to earlier. Um, I think the sector, though, like we're, we're just have been, you know, amazed and uh, really heartened by how innovative uh, the restaurateurs and the hoteliers 
and all of the sector has been in extremely difficult circumstances. I'm thinking of the, you know, the move to outdoor, the the um, a click and collect, um, and you know, I I do feel that some of those are going to be long term business, you know, within the long term business plan um, of restaurants going forward. And um, so, so it would be hopefully something that's retained. We are very supportive and optimistic on the recovery. Um, so we believe firmly that Irish tourism um, is, is very strong, uh, has great fundamentals and that, that it will return and recover. Uh, I suppose the only question is, is you know, how long? Um, I think there, as Neve has referred to, there, there are some uh, differences uh, across, across both um, the, uh, the sectors and across regionally. Uh, we think that uh, regional hotels uh, and restaurants are likely to emerge slightly quicker out of this. Um, have hopefully um, a good staycation market to go for. Um, city hotels and restaurants have been more impacted, um, and particularly city hotels where you know there is typically actually they're the most resilient uh, in a downturn because they they have a natural throughput. But none of that has been there uh, today. Uh, and going back to Mark's comments about Scotland as well, you know, we do need international travel to come back. So, I, I, but overall, we're very optimistic on the sector. Um, in terms of outlook, we, we expect a recovery to take, uh, for, the, for, the, for the more, more impacted city venues, to take maybe to 24, 25 uh, to recover. Um, um, but, but we're very firmly of the view that uh, this is a very strong industry and one that we're, you know, absolutely committed to supporting. I just want to bring you, Paul, before we go to the sort of the big question about connectivity, um, forbearance can't last forever. And as we said earlier, that six billion in overall revenue can't be replaced with schemes, even like the, the 55 million euro scheme that was announced um, last week. But do you agree with Cathy that actually perhaps that if we're only going to perhaps have a domestic uh, tourism season this summer, that it's the regions that are going to perhaps lead that? Are you optimistic about that kind of stay and spend or that staycation potential this summer? Yeah, uh, just a, a couple of points on, on, on the, 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 the staycation side of things this summer. I mean, you know, as Neve says, outdoor, outdoor is critical and, and there is a lot of work uh, progressing in that area. Some of it will have impact on this season and some will come through later. We've got about 20 Greenway projects going around the country now, working with our colleagues in the Department of Transport and, and, and getting those and all of the local authorities and getting those up and running and maximising the, tour, the tourism potential of them. There's about six mountain bike trails we're working on. We just last week announced funding with our colleagues in the Department of Rural and Community Development for 173 walks around the country. We, um, we're working with local authorities on 33 destinations, sorry, 32 destination town projects around the country, which is about enhancing the outdoor realm of urban areas. We will be launching uh, in very, very soon a, a new capital scheme that's going to focus uh, with working with local authorities on, on outdoor dining in key tourism urban areas and also urban animation to try and make the, 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 uh, the, those urban centres more the outdoor experience and the more attractive to try and bring, uh, and bring spoke, people in. Yeah. The, the, so, so that outdoor, and I'd, and I'd say really important for businesses uh, looking at this summer, you know, keep working on that outdoor offering, get your outdoor offering as, as, strong, as, as strong as you can get it. Also really important, and it's, and it's been alluded to there, the safety issue, that is still going to be with us. We have about 5,000 businesses signed up for the Falls Ireland COVID safety charter. I would say to any businesses who haven't signed up, now is the time, get mm. working on that. That is going to be, that, that safety reassurance is going to be really important to customers uh, across, across this summer if we, get, if we get open. And the other thing I'd say to businesses is the digital offering. We all know how much time we're all spending <laughs> online these days. Today is a classic example. And that's true for tourism, both domestic and international. Uh, but for this summer, I suppose, domestic. So optimising your digital presence, really key for businesses. So I'd say there, there we have a, 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 we've just completed field work on a, on a, on a new in-depth study on, uh, on the, the needs of the domestic market across this summer. And we're going to be rolling that out in the coming weeks to industry. So keep an eye out for that. And there's going to be some really good insights about how to pivot businesses to get the offering right and the pricing right and all other things to attract as much of that domestic business as possible. And just before I uh, go back to now, 
I just wanted to ask, I know it was only recently announced, but that 55 million euro fund, has yeah. there been much of a response or a, yeah. uh, interest in it? We, we, yeah, we've had, we've had a, a very, uh, obviously a, a, a very uh, positive response to that. Um, we had our webinar yesterday where we went through the details of that. We had about 407 businesses, I think, registered for that webinar. Uh, the applications open, uh, all of the details are on fallsireland.ie. The applications open uh, uh, tomorrow at, at noon uh, and they stay open uh, until early March. So I can't remember the exact date, but it'll all be up, up on the website. Mm -hmm. But, but the, the application period is about three or four weeks. But I'd say, so I'd say to people, you know, who are, who are interested in applying for that, all the details are there. Make sure you get all of the documents. One of the, the biggest things that will slow down people getting the money is not providing the information, not providing the documents. We've made it as simple as we can for people, but please read the details. Uh, look at what's required. Once you have that documents, the application pro process should be able to, you should be able to complete it within, a, within an hour. So it's not yeah. very long once you have the documents. So just get that information together, get it all complete, uh, double check everything and submit that to us. Now it will take us a couple, it will take us a matter of weeks, but it is weeks, not months. To, uh, to get those payments out yeah, to people. To get to administer it. Um, Niall Gibbons, there's a great um, cartoon in the Daily Telegraph this morning that Matt has done, and it's two boys in a, in a jail cell saying, what are you in for? And one's in for going to Morocco. <laughs> one's in for something else. But it just really, really captured um, the very, very serious headlines um, in the UK today with you know 10-day mandatory quarantines, the hotel industry, some upset about the possibility of hotels being taken over, and also these very, very um, uh, severe fines or penalties if you are found to have messed about with that system. But it all comes back to international connectivity and our dependence on that and getting air travel back up. What are your real kind of concerns around that at the moment? What do you think we could be doing? Because there's important messaging that goes out to those source markets and someone in New York or Chicago could be picking up a, a newspaper here and they might be thinking that Ireland is closed for business. Yeah, and it's amazing how fast the debate changes. Three months ago, we were talking about a traffic light system where it would be green, orange, red, and people were signing up to something that was given a common platform, and that was really positive news. And now we're talking about 10 days or 10 years. So it's amazing how this debate is changing every day, every week. So it just shows you it can change for the better again in three months' time. Mm. Uh, I think for us, the key thing is that, you know, in the normal days pre-COVID, we had nearly 620,000 seats every single week on sale to Ireland from all our international markets. What we're fairly certain is that, you know, when we get going again, major cities like London, Paris, you know, Amsterdam, Boston, New York, Chicago will be back quickly with lower frequency perhaps. But the real success of tourism uh, into Ireland in the 2015 to 19 period were, you know, routes that were built on from destinations that we didn't have before uh, or we'd had a long time ago, like San Francisco, LA, uh, Seattle. Dallas in America, for example. And tying in with Scotland on China and yeah, trying to... Exactly. The three flights coming in from mainland China, that's going to be wild. Emirates and Etihad only started service just over 10 years ago, but had grown them to double dailies. Mm -hmm. so, so this doesn't come back quickly. After 9-11, it took seven years to get back to previous levels of US air access. And we can't take for granted. These are mobile and it, assets. And it's something that Willie Walsh, in the, in the longer interview that people will be able to get to see, we spoke about that, about consolidation in the markets, um, you know, in terms of aviation, but also just there's going to be a big interest international fight for those slots and you know if there is any connectivity lost we really need to be out front and centre of that don't we? And we have to be out faster than our competitors that's the other thing and what the Aviation Recovery Task Force that I was a member of last year did was put together a very good report that went to government with 12 recommendations uh, many have been implemented but I think there is going to be a requirement for some incentive scheme we're really very fortunate to have Aer Lingus and Ryanair that deliver about 80% of our business we sometimes take them for granted which we shouldn't do um, but uh, it's great to have them the American carrier has got a 50 billion dollar bailout from the US government, Lufthansa, 9 billion from the EU, Air France, KLM, similar sort of figure. Uh, our carriers now, well, Aer Lingus got 150 million of a loan. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of work to be done here. I think we have to identify the strategic places that we need that capacity back from and how can we get it back as soon as possible? Because I keep on saying we can build all the pent up demand we want, but if the planes can't get here, the people will go somewhere else. Yeah. And is that something, Mark, just to go back to, obviously, just um, in terms of um, of consumer confidence. Like, I mean, what are you seeing there? Like, I mean, obviously you, you have a, a large international um, trade, but maybe just maybe not to the same extent as us. But is consumer confidence has it been dented in, in respect of the home or the overseas market? 
I think um, the rural communities obviously are very concerned still around, um, you know, the spread of the virus. We've got the north and south uh, divide as uh, anyway, but uh, the good thing is, is that we've got a very positive vaccine rollout. I think Scotland will have a million people vaccinated by the end of end of this week. Um, but it is about restoring that confidence. I mean, the, the hospitality industry and as of all the sector, you know, they've invested heavily in PPE. We have a good to go scheme um, over here as a kite mark, which sort of provides that reassurance. Um, but there is nervous uh, nervousness and it's about restoring in the messaging that, you know, we are a safe sector. Uh, and I think going back to the point that, you know, we say tourism is everyone's business. And I think this is really um, the impact has actually um, hit hard in everybody's pocket. Um, and so supporting local is a big key message um, that we're putting out, whether it's your local florist, your local producer, your local hotel, restaurant, once we're able to go again. So do the, we, are, we are a solution as well. And I think uh, we can employ many more people. We've, we've just, uh, one of our initiatives out of the task force was to protect some of our emerging talents and uh, the government have put up money to invest in uh, uh, 2,000 uh, colleagues who can come in and develop their leadership skills. But one of the uh, one of the programs that will modules will put into that is how to work together with communities, and that was very much part of our Outlook 2030 program. The importance of working together with communities and and being a force for good uh, as a sector. So nothing's really changed, but it's going to take a little longer, I think. And any anybody, they, I think it's the uncertainty of can I holiday now? When can I go? You know, there's no line in the sand of of when we'll actually reopen. Um, so, so we need to overcome that as well and give them the, the comfort and the reassurance that they can travel safely and enjoy a holiday uh, when they when they come to Scotland or or anywhere else in the UK for that matter. I think somebody has actually uh, invented a product where you can actually go onto an app and go in your favourite city and sit in the back of a taxi virtually <laughs> and pretend you are there. I want to go back to um, Neve. Um, one of the biggest themes that we've been talking about today and indeed it's preceded this conference as well is the importance of talent. And I know that you've been doing everything from yoga classes for your staff and online meetings and trying to organise uh, safe activities like walking and whatever it is. But that real um, one, the duty you owe to the people who have served that industry, but also that fear of not holding on to, to talent must be something that um, is a worry, especially if there is that pent up demand. So what has it been like, you know, managing, managing the staff across the two hotels? Uh, that's right, Durable. Um, I suppose, look, as a hotelier, um, I recognise that um, we're nothing without our team. Um, you know, being in a service industry, um, you rely on your people to deliver the warm hospitality that Kerry and that Ireland is renowned for. Um, of, so it's of a critical importance to us that we, we maintain the connection um, and that we do our utmost um, to, I suppose, support them, particularly during these uncertain times. So for us here at the Killarney Park and the Ross, we have have, um, I suppose we have been doing the ongoing safety training um, and training on new protocols. Uh, we're also uh, working on upskilling um, and I have to say that the ETBs and uh, the Munster Technology Institute um, are going to be a great support here at a local level um, as well as what is being done by um, the IHF and um, the, the, the plan that is being rolled out by Fault Ireland. So that will all help. But um, of course, yes, you need to do some of the, the fun stuff, I suppose, um, just to keep us all sane during these lockdowns. Um, so in that regard, um, we've had uh, walking, photography, uh, cooking challenges all going on virtually um, amongst the teams. So um, we're having a, a little bit of fun with that. Um, so that's, yeah. That's good, and it is good to hear. Um, I wanted now just to ask you, you've been doing this intensive research, it's revealing um, a lot, a lot of it very, very positive in terms of disposal, but I'm wondering, you know, we can't take anything for granted and we can't make any assumptions about the future needs of the future traveller because our, our approach to travel or, you know, what we want to do could be changing. Are you seeing anything coming into the research or any questions that you may ask in the future that actually could determine the shape of how the industry looks beyond the pandemic, presuming that it isn't just a case of going back to the old normal? 
I think what we're seeing is, are things that you say are common sense, you know, that there are people who want to spend more time outdoors, so places like the Wild Atlantic Way would have more appeal, so to speak. Uh, people are not going to feel comfortable at going to a rugby match with 50,000 people right now. But, you know, those things will come back, and we have to look at how we redefine city tourism. Mm -hmm. uh, I think those things have to be discussed in the context of sustainability. You know, we can't afford to get too crowded, uh, and I think that, that's a conversation that will need to be had in the next number of years. Um, but look, I think the key thing that's really stood out for me are those three common I made earlier on, people are, are dying to travel, they want to get back to familiar destinations, they want to get back to closer to home. But there's two words that have stood out in the last year in all the consumer research, that's wholesome reconnection. And we all know ourselves, tens of thousands of people that have been able to get back to connect for those big events, births, deaths, marriages and everything. And people want to get, yeah. a, that, that's the, the big emotional need I think that'll be driving tourism for the next 18 months. Yeah. And Cathy, when you're looking at the, the balance sheets of, of many of the businesses, are, are you kind of building in factors like that wholesome connection because as we say you know forbearance isn't a, a permanent strategy so um what are the the things that you're looking towards in terms of that recovery and that bounce you know that that justifies you know the banks and others pr providing that continued support yeah well i would say first of all um, i think the sector did um learn a lot from the last crisis and it, it entered this this crisis in better position from a balance sheet point of view um, so that that is helpful, um, but obviously we do need to try and you know look forward to the recovery. Um, I, I think we, you know, one thing that heartens us is that there is certainly uh, the one thing we can have certainty about is that there is money in people's accounts that uh, uh, that is uh, is there to be spent when lockdown uh, emerges. So. Uh, um, the central bank is saying over 13 billion in additional saving sto is stored into Irish accounts uh, in, in, in the, the months up to November of last year. And that has just uh, kept going, obviously, in the last couple of months. So there is pent up demand. Um, uh, we feel that a lot of that will go to hopefully towards the staycation market this year in Ireland and the restaurant market as it, as it, as it emerges. And then, yes, then we're looking to obviously to gradual recovery in terms of that uh, you know, all sorts of travel. And I, and I would agree with Paul, I think there's going to be a big focus on connecting um, outdoor uh, travel, um, uh, you know, and, th and those sort of new, new markets. I think for some of the, the companies, um, maybe need to think, particularly again, city centre ve venues, um, you know, ways of working have changed. So uh, are, are some of the locations going to need to think about their business model if they're quite reliant on city worker trade, for instance, um, these are the sort of longer term impacts that the industry is is grappling with. And, uh, you know, it's really hard to predict at the moment where, where that will go to. Um, but uh, they're, they're just some thoughts that we would have. Absolutely. And um, I just, Mark, just before I bring it back to studio, um, I'm just thinking of your, your vision out to 2030. Did you have to revise much of it in light of what's happened in the last year or are much of the essentials still there? It very much. Uh, we did a COVID overlay of it uh, as part of the task force considerations and uh, our four priority areas are around people, business, experience and place, but very much through the lens of sustainability. So, um, you know, that's that they, they sit there um, you know, putting people at the heart of it and obviously business sustainability, both in an economic sense, as well as the sort of greening of the country. So um, we are looking to segue back into that through through the action plan that has been set out in the task force. And I just suppose just coming back on Niall's comment there about rugby, I think 50,000 Scots would actually want to be at Murrayfield this weekend <laughs> after last weekend because it's given us a real boost and long may we can continue to win because it's uh, certainly boosted the morale of the country. But yes, our outlook is, is and the priorities are very much um, the same. Uh, and, uh, you know, to be the world leader in 21st century tourism was the strap line. And, you know, we set out to be the world leader in 21st uh, century tourism recovery. I was waiting for a bit of a, 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 a bit of an indicator there in the rugby. Um, uh, Niall and Paul, just to bring it back to studio before we close the panel, I just wanted to ask you both, what are the short and long term things that you are worried about and hopeful for? I might start with you, Paul. Um, well, look, just to pick up on, on, on some of the points that, are, that have been raised, I think, you know, you know short and, and long term are city centres, you know, in terms of it. It's, it's not just the, it's not just the tourism issue. I think, you know, lots of companies are finding in their research that, that, you know, they don't envisage their full workforces coming back into their offices five days a week. What's that going to mean for restaurants and cafes and hotels? I think 
Um, also, um, you know, day-to-day -day corporate business travel is also going to be challenged where people are working with people they work with day in, day out. They're not building new relationships or new networks. So, so they can do that. They're much more comfortably do, doing that over these kind of platforms now. So I, I think, you know, in terms of that, how do we reimagine our city centres is an essential is an essential thing. I think importantly, business tourism, where it's the it's the the, the conferences and events, not the day to day corporate travel, but those networking events where people are building new relationships, they're still important, and, and they still, and we'll need to we we'll need to fight really hard to bring as much of that business because that will be there. Virtual developments will ever replace that that contact that people are yeah, creating. Yeah, and I think I think you know hybrid will be will be important yeah. and stuff. I think that, that that will be so. It's about how do we make sure we're at the cutting edge of that and invest and support that enough. I think around that, around that and, business. And that's something America. you said, Niall, just you know about having to be constantly not just at the the ballpark, but right out in front of it. What what is both? I suppose g end us on a hopeful note. But what are you sort of worried about, and what do you think is the most hopeful prospects for? for the island of Ireland just now? Uh, the worry obviously is short-term business survival. You know, you need people to be able to come out the other end because the bottom line is that the customer comes, Tourism Ireland doesn't sell anything. It's the, it's the business at the, at the front line that delivers the experience that we make a promise of in the marketplace. Uh, in terms of the hope bit, I mean, the connectivity is key. You know, next month, St. Patrick's Day, it's like Tourism Ireland's Christmas. No one else has this in the world for, for you know, for any country it will be green with envy to be able to do what we do, and uh, not just tourism Ireland, but everybody collectively. We've got a great programme that's going to make sure that Ireland will trend number one in the globe for all the right reasons. So there's still plenty of hope out there, and I think the conversation on this can change very quickly. Mm -hmm. I think wait till the end of March when the UK has vaccinated its entire at-risk population. I think the debate will start to change, and people will start to think not to start to travel, but think to start about how we move on to the next chapter. Yeah, we never know. Maybe, maybe Luke, we might be uh, drinking pints in the garden uh, sooner than we hope, and hopefully we will. But look, that is all we have time for today. Um, thanks to Niall, to Paul, to all of our guests who joined me in studio and online. It looks like I think we had close to nearly 3,000 people joining us virtually, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, and thank you so much for that. Well, earlier on, you saw him in our Reeling uh, in the Year style video at the start of uh, our virtual conference. And I'm joined now in person, in studio, by EDIC Chief Executive Owen O'Mara Walsh. Your first virtual conference, were you happy enough um, about how things yeah, went? Yeah, it was absolutely brilliant the last three hours. I'm sure you're an expert in all things tourism at this stage. We had over 2,500 delegates register, which is brilliant. And I think, you know, looking back on the whole morning, I think Willie Walsh probably put it best or, or most aptly, industry working with government can get us out of this mess. Yeah, and that was a very powerful message that he had. Of course, an event like this does not happen without the support of a huge team uh, behind the scenes. Absolutely. This ITIC conference would not have been possible without the support of our sponsors. So that's Fulch Ireland, Tourism Ireland and AIB. And it would be remiss of me not to mention Arlene and Catherine and Mark in the office who have done absolutely Trojan work and our conference partners' advantage. As you've heard this morning, there is a future beyond COVID and this wonderful industry of ours can thrive again. And we hope that it will. Well, look, the conversation continues online using the hashtag ITICConf21. I know it was trending earlier on this morning, but from us, stay safe, hold fast to hope, and thank you for being with us today.